it was harder to join. But anyway, we're here. All right. Next, I think uh, Eva is going to call in. I know if she has, I don't see. Oh, she's, yeah, Eva's called in. So it's uh, 5.03, and I'd like to call to order the Concord. Well, welcome to the joint Concord Carlisle Concord School Committee's uh, December 15th, 2020 meeting. I'd like to call the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee to order. And I'd like to call the Concord School Committee to order. It is December 15th, and we will note we are being recorded and we will do a, a roll call attendance, please. Anderson is present. Booth present. Oh, present. Who's that present? Mostafi present. Randy present. Wilson present. Okay. And so, uh, if you need a motion, I can move. Great. You'd be so I kind, will... Heather, yeah move that both the Concord School Committee and Concord Carlisle Regional School Committees enter into executive session under purpose two of the open meeting law to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel and purpose three of the open meeting law pursuant to MGL uh, chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation in the case of L.Y. versus Kester Kruger CCTV Inc. Town of Concord and Concord Carlisle School District as an open meeting may have a detriment, detrimental effect on the litigating position of the committees as declared by the chair and return to open session at 5.30 p.m. And thank you. Do we have a second? Second for both. And discussion. Uh, those in favor, roll call, please. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. That I for both. Ms. Dent, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Rainy, I for both. And Wilson for region. And again, we note that we uh, intend to be back at 5.30 if uh, at all possible. That's our, our objective here. So, Erin, just keep an eye. The person we're expecting to join us was having trouble getting in, so she's not on yet. Hopefully. Are we all back here now? Yes. I do not see the record. Oh, there's the record. Okay. Uh, all right. Welcome back. Uh, it's 546. We are returning to open session. Um, this meeting's being recorded. And um, I think we will begin with uh, with. We need to do another roll call, don't we? No? Uh, Lori, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. You came into session before you went, you called into session before you moved move. to exec, so you should be okay. Okay, so we'll just move, begin with uh, public comment. If it is your first time coming, please raise your hand under the participants tab on uh, Zoom if you have a comment to make. In court, I am not seeing any raised no. hands. I'm, nope. seeing, I'm seeing none. Um, I don't, uh, do we have the uh, student liaisons on our most current agenda? We don't, I apologize, but I see at least one. Oh, they're both here. Yeah. here. Yeah. So, so at your one, at your pleasure would be for the chairs to put them in. Why don't we put them at the top of our chairs and liaisons report, they they being liaisons as well. Can that be sufficient? Sure. Okay. So with, with that, I wonder, uh, hi, Amy, and uh, your colleague, Linda, good evening. Thanks for being, being with us. I wonder uh, if you could bring us up to date. You're both on mute at the present time. 
we have a sense that you're about uh, a week away from a well-deserved break and we want it to be a safe one. Uh, give us your insight. What's, what's happening at the school? Amy, would you like to start or I can start? Oh, I can start, yeah. Um, okay. um, so the couple of things that have happened over the past few weeks is we had a like, a like a winter sports fair kind of thing and they weren't, you know, nothing set in stone about how winter sports are going to work, but we did have, we were able to put together like a social distance friendly kind of winter sports fair with Senate. And then we also had like a big, because we can't do spirit week this year, which is usually like the big event of the fall for Senate. We kind of did like a window decorating thing. So we were able to organize uh, different clubs come in and uh, make safely be spread apart and design a window. So we can kind of have some of the normal spirit week stuff without having the big spirit assembly that we usually are able to do. And that was at the yeah. cafeteria, correct? Yeah, that was, uh, that was outside the windows in the cafeteria. Yeah, it looked terrific. Thank you. Um, in addition, I think the fall sports season was overall a success besides um, the DCL wins for our boys soccer team, our cross country teams, and the field hockey team. Just the fact that it was able to proceed, obviously, football and cheerleading weren't able to continue because they're in such close contact. Um, and we didn't have um, massive breakouts on teams like some other schools had. So I, I think that brings a lot of people hope for the winter speed for the winter season that has officially started. Um, I believe tryouts for most teams started yesterday um, for the sports that are continuing on to the winter season. In addition, some uh, a lot of clubs have been able to continue on with fundraising. For example, the Intersections Club did a sticker sale and they raised four hundred fifty dollars, and half the proceeds went to Black Lives Matter, and the other half went to the Massachusetts Bail Fund. So even with COVID, I think we're able to have some sense of normalcy, like Amy was saying. I mean, it's not completely normal, but we're all trying our best. And I think that's all we can appreciate. And then I think we also had a quick question about, uh, you know, we have the, a, a snowstorm coming up on Thursday. And I know that, uh, so we're not going to be having students anymore because we need to have a virtual system. But people have been wondering, like, what's, what's going to happen if students lose power? Like they're going to have to uh, make it up when they get power back and have double the work, or is there going to be like a system set up so they can get it done? You guys don't miss a beat. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a text chain with all my colleagues today about all the power <laughs> issues if that were to happen. And uh, and I think, you know, the answer is if it's widespread, we, we're going to have to go back to more of a traditional snow day mode. Um, if there's pockets of it, that's a different, that's a challenge for sure. And I'm going to have to make some hard decisions about how we manage that. Um, clearly we're going to have to be flexible and forgiving. If kids don't have power, there's no way we can <laughs> ask you to be keeping up with what's going on. So mm -hmm. that, that may be once we get to the point where we know we're remote, um, on this week or any other day, then that has to be the other part of the discussion is keeping an eye on the power. So mm -hmm. I don't know. We're going to maybe have power days now instead of snow. Time. <laughs> 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 Everything keeps changing here, but you're right. That's, there are two, um, two spots that we are most vulnerable. And I would say power and internet are the two. So both of those have to be on the, on the watch list for sure. Yeah. I think that's it for us. Well, we want to thank you very much for uh, your, your leadership. And we hope that uh, the, in addition to bringing important information to us, you'll uh, share your resilience with your, your colleagues back at the school. Thank you very much and have a very safe holiday, please. Can I just jump in quickly before you to go because you both said something about you know doing the best giving situation and that just resonated with me. I'm constantly amazed at everything that all the students are doing at the high school and making it work and, and the administration's done a lot to enable it, but then you guys are taking it and just, running with it and really making it as successful as possible. So I just wanted to appreciate you for that and for all you guys are doing there. It's awesome. Um, also, if you all don't mind, I think Amy and I said that we were planning to stay for the whole meeting, if that's okay. So we can maybe, of course. <laughs> yeah. Just so we can like listen in. I mean, it's been, it's been hard as seniors to deal with like, the first semester stuff and dealing with college apps, but we're slowly getting out of that. <laughs> I, I want You're to, always welcome for the whole thing. We're never yeah. kicking you out. We just don't want to hold you hostage. <laughs> the last time we saw you, it was people were starting to feel uh, the weight of stuff, but 
things are things are rounding things are things are things are on an upswing now everybody's looking forward to <laughs> a little rest over vacation and hope safe and well, well for seniors right now this is the, the a couple of weeks that early decisions and early action uh, college you know decisions coming out so i think it's definitely a, a pretty stressful time right now for seniors but i think for for other people i think definitely we're, we're, you can kind of see that break is is close so that's that's good too Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Thanks. <laughs> okay. okay, so Sarah, should we ask for other uh, other chairs and liaisons reports? Yeah. Uh, I didn't put this on the um, agenda, but um, to Amy and Linda as well, I just received before this meeting an email from the people who run Concord Together, which is a local initiative here in town to encourage people um, to shop locally, especially given all of the ramifications to our storefronts here um, in the pandemic. Um, and they wrote to me um, because I helped with Lori facilitate um, the meeting with the student with you guys in the Senate um, and they all said that you guys are an absolute joy to work with and they are so grateful and um, they're just really excited to um, partner with you guys moving forward. So that was really, really a great email to get. Appreciate it. That's awesome. Yeah, we um, actually were talking about them the last Senate meeting and we're, we have a little committee called the Social Media Committee. And I think um, some of those small businesses in Concord Center were saying that's something they might need help with because they aren't really familiar with all the oh, different guys. social media them, platforms. And they're, like, they're all like, they're even older than me and they're so clueless. They are so <laughs> excited to engage with you guys. Um, you, The meeting with them, my very first meeting with them before I had them engage with you was like hilarious. So they're really excited about your willingness to help them. That's awesome. Thank you. So, um, Court, should we do a quick update on the middle school, although it's just conquered quickly? I, sure. Yeah. Do you, do you want to start? Want me to? Sorry? Uh, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I'll, I mean, it, it's very high level, just that the middle school building committee is, is kicking off again and meeting again. Um, we had kind of an initial, so to speak, planning meeting um, just last week on Thursday. It was really a touch base welcome back, let's start to plan again. So there's nothing too much to really announce out of it other than uh, we're gonna try to start to get our ducks in a row and, and realign a new schedule. We recognize that uh, this might result fully in a year's delay in opening a school, um, best case scenario, but uh, that's not a certainty. Uh, and after reconvening the committee, uh, and it met with full strength, didn't lose anybody in the intervening eight or nine months, uh, the chairs are uh, looking carefully at the very aggressive schedule right now. And so we expect to hear from the chairs and the community will hear about this timetable uh, rather soon. Yeah, and as always, communication both outbound and inbound are important. So as once we have something to actually update, we'll be getting updates out. Um, and at some point we'll, we'll be trying to collect information too. We'll certainly plan public forums and all that kind of stuff. So all of that is yet to come, but um, just the update that we're starting to talk about it again. We, we have no dates to share at this point. Nothing yet. Good. To that point, <clears throat> Is it the committee's policy to post packets that you receive so that the public can see these packets in your meetings? Uh, <laughs> they've been getting, and we've addressed this both with the OPM and the architects, they've been getting to us right as the meeting happens. So it got posted after the meeting. We are in agreement with what I expect your point is, Cynthia, that we like those materials earlier. I mean, I, it is difficult. It's, I mean, I be frank, I'm completely have no idea where this project is and I'm paying attention. So I think the public is, I think the most important thing you could do at the beginning of this restart is to clearly communicate where the project is today. Yeah. 
or yeah that's actually something i've been talking about cynthia is, and we've asked the architect to help us with that so right now we we just have to create a you know a page or a one page or something that is here's where we are after this all this time and i think we're still figuring out where are we after all this time? Um, so yes, in complete agreement and something that's an update, a where are we update come out as soon as possible. And I think a public forum as early as possible in January. So, and none of this is settled at this point. This is These are the timelines we're discussing. Um, we left, the challenges we left off in a place with some things unresolved. So it's a question of, do we need to do a little bit of committee work first and then bring it to the public or do we do it the other way around? And I think we're still okay. still discussing. Okay. You're right, it needs to be soon. I'd say in the month of January, if not first thing. Okay. That's my hope. I just have a quick select board update. Um, the calendar has sort of been set for the election. Um, it is coming right up. The caucus, I think the problem is we're legally supposed to hold a caucus. So mm -hmm. they need to get some kind of legislation through the state to not hold a caucus, or we'll have to have an outdoor caucus or something. Um, that's supposed to be uh, January 25th. The papers have to be turned in the 4th of February, and the election is March 25th right now. Mm -hmm. so, um, the warrant opens on 227 and closes on 326. So that seems far away, but it is not. <laughs> the other little housekeeping thing is they voted to approve a new APP for electrifying the fleet. And in that APP, it says that we have a policy. <laughs> yes. But we don't. We, do we? we don't. We are aware we don't. And we notified them that we don't. <laughs> um, I was in touch with Kate Hanley. Court brought it up. And I think you were maybe in touch with them, too, or at least noticed it. So we need to talk about what that could be. I think the policy subcommittee can can put it on their list. That's where they voted to approve the policy, whatever that meant, the school committee in uh, 2013. So Yes. We, <laughs> yes. So, I can't explain all of that, but we know we don't have a policy the way that it says. I mean, it, it's not a huge impact as it does not affect the buses directly, but they're, they're not included. So, um, Cynthia, give us the warrant dates again, please. Oh, sure. Uh, the warrant opens on 2-27, February 27, and closes on March 26. Thank you. And our hearing is on May 6, <laughs> and town meeting is June 13. That could change, uh, not the town meeting dates or the hearing dates, but the election dates. Mm -hmm. Other reports? Yes, uh, we had our first policy uh, meeting. The the uh, subcommittee for um, policy met um, last week, and um, sorry, this is my first report, so I'm going to help you help me with You're it. You're doing uh, great. <laughs> uh, yes, so um, we had representation from uh, MASC um, along with. Um, uh, Lori and Eva and uh, Alexa were there, and uh, we're starting our work for for this year. It was um, exciting to get uh, to get started, and we have our uh, next meeting scheduled for January already. Excellent. And I understand uh, you are chair, Fatima. Am I correct? Yes, I am. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, let's note that we promised uh, Linda and Amy that we would copy them on policy subcommittee communications. Mm -hmm. So we'll want to want to do that. Good. Other reports. I can mention a few. Uh, the Public Access Advisory Committee met last week. Uh, we were brought up to date by Phil, uh, the uh, the studio director, uh, that the education director position is still pending. Uh, status uh, a little bit unclear as to when the town might move on that. And uh, we were brought up to date on the uh, high school music and sports coverage that is underway. 
Uh, let's see what else. Uh, uh, we know that uh, Metco had its uh, legacy celebration last Friday, uh, virtually. It was very nicely done. And we uh, have had communications from uh, other school committees in regard to winter athletics. Lots of lots of discussion about winter athletic uh, and uh, quite quite a range of uh, decisions being made about uh, winter athletics uh, across the Commonwealth. And what else? And then uh, uh, we saw the correspondence from the uh, eighth grade civics classes. Uh, and I think it numbered well in excess of 100 uh, uh, communications. Uh, most of them uh, were uh, uh, really, really devoted to one topic, and that was how to observe uh, what is uh, uh, generally referred to as Columbus Day, uh, also referred to as Indigenous Peoples Day. Some students uh, referred to it as Discovery and Remembrance Day. Lots of uh, very thoughtful ideas about uh, that holiday for consideration by the calendar group when it uh, convenes next. And I think, I think that was it for me. And I just want to recognize it's not quite a report, not quite correspondence. I don't know where it falls, but I do want to call attention to something that that we learned about today where Trish McGean has uh, been recognized as an everyday hero. And uh, I think that's just wonderful. And uh, I... It's wonderful. I was... Yeah. And I was, I haven't actually said anything to her yet. It's too emotional for me because I can't believe someone else is felt that I don't know how she has time to be as supportive to so many people, given what I know she's doing just with us. So yeah, she's in the globe as an everyday hero for 2020 and uh, it's really great. Good stuff. Uh, it's one thing to be a, a hero. It's another thing to be a hero every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On the globe. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate. Indeed. So, and Court, you covered all of your correspondence. I yes, yeah, so I uh, the I, I thought I'd received one in, uh, in support of our testing, but I was unable to dig it up. So that might have been reported at the previous meeting. If so, uh, forgive me for being confused tonight. Uh, but uh, that was the only one. Uh, Oh, 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 recently. Great. I'll just comment quickly on all the letters we got from the eighth graders that I was very impressed. They did a great job of laying out their arguments in either direction on Columbus Day versus Indigenous Peoples Day, most of them. So kudos to the eighth grade. Yes, here, here. <laughs> so I think we can move on to Superintendent Sarah. Yep. Okay, Dr. Hunter. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna talk at a high level and just select certain topics. A lot of this you've heard in other venues and maybe even we'll hear more of tonight. So I, I plan to be brief. Um, just a reminder that we had our second of three professional development path afternoons um, on the 2nd of December. People are really attending um, high interest topics, a lot to do with social, emotional, cultural competency. Um, I have this gift of working with about 20 teachers who are potential leaders or just fascinated with the leadership side of how things happen. Um, so it's been a real success. Kudos to everybody. Um, we had a professional day Friday, which I can't say enough of the just the wisdom. And so much of this year, I think we haven't realized the wisdom we had at the moment is we realize it more as it plays out. And this may be one of those where we knew it was a good idea to not use all those days in the beginning of the year. I'm not sure we appreciated just how good of an idea. Um, it's been just a real, real plus to get that day once a month or so that allows teachers to plan and collaborate and um, get ready for what's coming, wrap up what they've just done. Um, just been really well-timed. 
In terms of uh, academic growth and uh, supporting students, uh, we now have uh, selected students either in or plans for them to be in at both middle and high school to attend on a full-time basis. So we've expanded that opportunity past the initial groups that had started that way. We're, we're really excited about being able to do that and how that has gone. Um, we've also trained more staff in our RTI in the program we will use during RTI level literacy intervention, and that will allow us to continue to um, expand on the RTI offerings as we get into the second part of the school year um, so that we have more st staff available and trained. Um, one piece we did look at as I go to one of the next goals is just the impact of COVID and teaching and learning and th that intersection. One piece we've spent the last couple of weeks working on with the CTA is, is the plan for elementary students who are in quarantine, the older kids can zoom in, the elementary kids can't in the morning. Um, so we've been really getting some structure to that, setting up some common approaches to that, helping um, both for a quick turnaround, right? You don't get a lot of notice when a child's going to be quarantined. So everyone's aware of what's going to happen and how the morning will go. And then in the afternoon, they can remote in. So we feel, we feel good about that. It um, feels consistent and um, academically sound. Um, I think my other comments really are more COVID focused. Uh, we did have a successful webinar on the 3rd of December and almost 200 people attended. And then we shared the recording. That's all as case counts have um, obviously spiked. We had our 43rd today. I notice will go out the set tonight when I get off that um, states that to the community. And we continued to do this successfully. Um, we have been sending families and staff to the site in Cambridge very positively. The feedback we've gotten has been how effective and efficient that has been. Turnaround times for testing continue to be 24 hours or better. And that has just taken what I shared with you last week. And the more that happens and becomes part of our routine, if if families and staff choose that, it's it's a choice. You don't have to go there. Um, but we are seeing a positive outcome there. We do need a little bit more uh, materials essentially on site for the CCHS testing to begin, primarily a lockbox. So we have a storage setting for them um, to then come collect the tests. So that is gonna take until the first of the year, I think, to get going. And um, that's okay. The Cambridge option has been such a nice positive that I think it's uh, helped with the urgent situation we've been feeling just with the numbers of close contacts and um, symptomatic people are, we're doing a little bit better. Still challenging, but doing a little bit better. Uh, this morning I met with all the nurses and principals. We're making a plan for COVID related communication over the break. So watch for that to come. Shifting topics, Jared's been working on the preliminary budget with the central office and building leaders. He will start collating that in January. That's when I get invited in to look at what they're um, hoping for and proposing. In addition to just status quo, at this point we're proposing two budgets, I think is where we landed and Jared's gonna um, share those and then make our way through how we bring it to you. Do we bring you two? Do we use those two to inform a combined budget? You know, COVID and non-COVID is obviously the theme. So more to come on that, but he's deep in the build. Um, this week I will meet with, in terms of cultural competency, and this is on later, so I'll only mention a couple of things. I do have a coffee with the uh, Boston families this week that is part of their monthly meetings and the cultural competency committee met last week. And then my final highlight is, as referenced, the building project has gotten up and going, and I am very much in the discussion of all those points that you made on scheduling and things like that, working with the designers and OPM and chairs to really get settled in on what the timeline is going to be. So a lot of great stuff happening among, the, among, the, uh, among all the rest of it, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from anybody? From Lori? There's a lot of lot a lot of what you've just talked about coming our way uh, <laughs> in the coming minutes. Yes, and, and hours. Yeah. So I think with that we can welcome uh, 
our administration from the elementary, middle, and high schools to share school improvement plans. And if you could, for 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 the courtesy of us who are new to this group, if you could all just introduce yourselves briefly, that would be great. So to make it easy, uh, why don't we work alphabetically, Alcott, Naomi, if you would. Hi, I'm Naomi Krako. I'm the principal at Alcott Elementary School. And then over to Thoreau for Angel. Hi, I'm Angel Charles, the principal of Thoreau Elementary School. Thank you. And Willard, Matt. Hey, good evening. I'm Matt Lucy. I'm the principal at the Willard. And, uh, now we'll move up to our middle school, Justin. Good evening, Justin Cameron, principal. Hi, Justin. School. And uh, uh, high school, Mr. Mistrullo. Hello, all. Mike Mistrullo, principal of high school. Excellent. And Kristen, you are known to us as well, aren't you? <laughs> Good. So we're going to uh, ask you to suggest to us how you want to uh, present. Uh, we do have links, as you know, in the agenda. So they've made, I think, a slide a piece. Uh, the elementary plan is a combined plan this year because of the nature of the work we're doing. Um, so we can start with them and make our way up. Does that work? Excellent. Yeah. Do you have the slides pulled up, any of you, or do you want me to do that? I do not. OK, I'll grab them. One quick moment. But you're up first, right, Mr. Lucy? I am. So maybe, uh, Dr. Under, if it's OK, as you're pulling up the slides, some prefacing remarks uh, and how uh, Angel uh, and Naomi and I have been working together. And it's been a really a byproduct of the work that we've been doing since last May uh, with uh, our plan to return to school. And so in the past, we um, valued each other's input and we relied on each other for support and for uh, probing questions and clarity, and even more so now as we are working so closely together um, and uh, getting the schools back open keeping them open, keeping them safe, and also a place for learning. So the, the plan that you have before you um, is one that uh, covers all three elementary schools, and it's based upon the uh, same uh, school improvement goals um, that the superintendent uh, has as our, our, our overarching plan. So you'll see that they're very familiar, but they are tuned to our present conditions. And each uh, is addressed in every building, and there are slight variances just based on uh, different needs of buildings, um, whether it's the, the brick and mortar or um, space or other variables. But what we'll be doing is taking each of the, um, of the goals and uh, discussing how they are being implemented this year. Either they have been implemented or we plan to. So I'm going to begin. Um, with multiple paths to success. And again, during the pandemic, uh, what we need to do is continue to sustain student engagement, curriculum coverage, and academic growth for all students um, in this unique time, um, and to make sure that we were achieving this goal for students that were in person, that were hybrid or remote. And um, so we took uh, special attention to ensure that number one, that we were monitoring student attendance, and with the support of the school um, nurses to ensure that we are tracking um, illness and um, we have protocols in place. And uh, speaking for the three of us, you know, this is an area that um, is number one in our daily work. Um, and it's an important job that we do and we're happy to do. And, but going down to our second um, uh, initiative, it's the work that we have had the good fortune to share with um, Trish McGean. Um, we have learned from her, we have leaned on her, and uh, because of that, um, we've been able to sustain a very productive learning environment where students and staff feel safe. Um, so we're deeply uh, indebted to her and very grateful for her work. And it goes out saying that uh, every call that we make, uh, the good doctor is following up and calling us. So uh, Dr. Hunter has been the backbone of our operation and uh, I know that all the principals feel the same, but speaking just as one member of the elementary team, we're uh, very grateful for her work. Um, when we were looking for how do we sustain all our students' needs, uh, the development of the Remote Learning Academy, 
It had to be comprehensive. It had to be cohesive. It had to uh, uh, support learning for all students and also embrace the the, and, and knowing and understanding the challenges of a complete remote environment. Um, but I think that uh, the, the information that we have gleaned and has, uh, as we have grown and also the feedback that we receive from parents and students is that we're uh, hitting on all cylinders and we're very proud of what's being offered. And um, we have had um, students who have begun in the remote learning academy who have returned to school, but also we've had some that, given circumstances uh, in the family or otherwise, have transitioned to the remote academy. And I need to say that um, that uh, when those requests are made uh, in each building, uh, we can facilitate it uh, fairly quickly. And um, and it's nice because there's continuity because we share uh, other activities with these students. That there is a sense of community within the uh, classroom if you were in person or within the virtual learning academy, but also um, within the greater school communities. So we're feeling that that's going quite well. Um, additionally, that uh, all our special subject teachers are remote um, and they're, they have asynchronous and synchronous work. Um, it's a deep curriculum and one that, um, that they've invested deeply in. And um, again, I think hitting their mark that there is um, a sense of greater collaboration across the building. So um, one thing that we all talk about is the unexpected silver linings. And I think this is another one of those unexpected silver linings um, that we have uh, greater and deeper discussions, uh, clarity. And as Dr. Hunter was mentioning earlier, the gift of having these professional days uh, periodically where these uh, teachers who ordinarily don't have the luxury of, of working together along content areas have a chance to work uh, together. So that's been a real boon for us. And then also we've expanded on our uh, progress monitoring work. Uh, we've implemented STAR 360 thanks to Kristen Herbert and her work. Um, this was to ensure that we could have a means of doing progress monitoring across all content areas um, using technology and ensuring that whether the student was in person or remotely, we could understand where they were, um, if there were gaps, what we could do and how we could implement some uh, response intervention um, initiatives. And this is on top of the other um, progress monitoring that we do, whether it's EM4 or um, DRA or Columbia Teachers College, uh, Ponson Pinnell Foundations or Lucy Hawkins are all still in place. So this was a nice way of uh, adding an additional initiative to uh, make sure that we were attending to the needs of the students uh, during the uh, during this difficult time. And then lastly, I need to um, share uh, that all three of, of the elementary school principals are just so thrilled with the work that our classroom teachers have been doing. Um, I think it's interesting to paint a picture. Um, every day classroom teacher has before them um, a cohort of students and that cohort of students um, are being instructed in a whole different way than they had prior to March where they had students in place and then in the afternoon, now they have a hybrid learning environment. Couple that with now the um, reality of having a student who, may, who might be um, um, COVID positive uh, within, a, um, within a close uh, family uh, connection. So that student then is quarantined. So then what you're doing is you're teaching those students in front of you. You are also maintaining their learning in the hybrid and you're also attending to that student now who has been um, quarantined. Um, and then there's the chance that one day your whole class gets quarantined, right? And these things happen, um, these instances happen almost on a daily occurrence, and our staff is um, prepared to manage all those transitions, and they're doing so in a brilliant professional manner. I must say, and I'm sure that uh, Angel and Naomi uh, are also feeling uh, that they aren't the most welcome person when they enter a room, because often when I enter a room now, people are wondering, is it me now? Am I going out or is someone I know going out? Mm -hmm. But the staff have been tremendous. Um, so uh, thank you to the school committee for your foresight and providing additional uh, time for this work to be done. Thank you to Dr. Hunter for your, um, your leadership. It's, it's uh, so valued. And uh, Trish McGean is, is um, wholeheartedly deserving of the, of the recognition that she got. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a wonderful way that, that we've been able to maintain multiple paths for student success, even in these difficult times. So I think, uh, Angel, you're gonna talk a little bit about well-being. Yes, thank you, Matt. 
Uh, so the next goal that I'm going to speak to is um, a goal around student well-being. And we think about well-being, we think about both the physical safety, which is something that we've had to think about and consider more than ever this year, along with the social and emotional and mental well-being of students, uh, many of whom um, have not been able to see their friends as they have in the past. So, and they've been isolated for a period of several months. So we knew that we had to take um, specific measures to support the well-being of all of our students in this changed environment. So one of the um, surprises that we had this year was that we were able to adopt a universal free school lunch program, um, which was wonderful. Um, prior to us adopting the free lunch model, I would say that our lunch counts were averaging between five and seven a day. And since we've adopted the universal free school lunch program, um, if it's pizza or chicken tenders day, we may have a hundred or more orders. So that's been fantastic. Um, of course, it brought with us the challenge of how we can provide contactless delivery for the lunches um, and trying to get them as time the delivery of the lunches as close to dismissal as possible so that students are taking home something that's still warm or fresh to eat when they get home. So that's been exciting. I'm blown away by um, the response that we've had to the universal free lunch program. Um, in addition, you know, like I had mentioned before about trying to find ways in which students can feel connected to one another while keeping a physical and safe distance, um, we've had to come up with uh, interesting and, and new ways to uh, allow students to maintain connections with their peers and friends who are in other grades or in other classrooms. Um, we're still work. I think this is going to be something that we work on uh, throughout the entire school year. Um, but here and there, we're finding different ways for students to feel connected, whether it's by uh, reinstating buddy programs, um, pen pals with students in other countries, everything that we can possibly pull out, we are, we are trying. In addition, many times this year, I've said that I felt like a first year principal, even though I've been doing this for many years. Um, and part of that started this summer when we started thinking about the nuts and bolts. And I, I think that Naomi and, and Matt feel the same way and that we've had to completely revise all of our daily routines. Um, you know, moving, getting students safely in and out of the building uh, every day at the number of students that we have is always a challenge. But how do we do that? And then also, you know, try to provide contactless drop off and pick up, make sure that all students get to their buses on time, make sure that students aren't clustering in the restrooms, that they're not on top of one another, especially as a challenge at the elementary level when moving about the hallways and maintaining social distancing. So we have completely overhauled all of our daily routines um, to really prioritize social distancing and safety. Um, we are also um, working very closely with our uh, office administrative team, along with our school nurses, to really uh, work very closely on our universal outreach and screening around the uh, COVID daily screener. Um, that has been an invaluable tool that we found uh, in tracking and monitoring student symptoms and then following up with either testing or whatever else has to happen afterwards. So that's another um, big goal that that we've successfully implemented around keeping students safe. Um, in addition, I, I had mentioned this at my uh, school advisory council last night. Um, you know, one of the best parts of of this of school years past has been the amount of parent volunteers that we've had throughout the building. Um, and I was mentioning to some of the parents that if you came into the, the school building this year, you might not recognize it because we have really um, rethought all the physical spaces in the building and adapted the physical spaces to make sure that there's PPE um, in every space to make sure that students are seated um, according to the COVID guidelines at safe distances from one another. Um, our health offices are all equipped with waiting rooms with negative pressure ventilation systems. And we've really just used every possible viable space to make sure that uh, students and staff are are safe and spread out for both instruction. And then we've also had to rethink space for um, special education service providers and for small group instruction to happen in a way that maintains confidentiality. So uh, those were some of the goals uh, that we've uh, been working on to try to maintain a safe um, and well uh, student body this year. Naomi, I'm gonna pass it over to you to talk about inclusive culture.
All right. Um, so I will talk a little bit about our thinking around inclusive culture. And so um, the only thing I'm going to read is sort of our overarching goal. And then I'll just talk to you guys a little bit. But um, we set the goal um, for inclusive culture that during the pandemic, we will continue to work to ensure that all students feel valued, respected, and welcome no matter what the learning environment, um, because we, we are teaching in um, three different environments, uh, in-person, hybrid, remote. Um, and we all also have populations that are fully in-person as well. Um, and so we approach this goal um, kind of from two directions. Um, so there's sort of two, two facets to this goal. Um, there's, there's the facet that is directly tied to um, our current circumstances with the pandemic. Um, and so we've done a lot of thinking about how do we help the community feel connected um, how do we help ensure that regardless of whether kids are fully in-person, sort of our hybrid in-person model or fully remote, that they all feel like they're part of one community. Um, and so we're, and this is similar to some of the things that Angel mentioned um, in the well-being goal. This is, this is ongoing work, um, but we're trying to figure out how we can um, keep the same sense of community um, and inclusivity that has existed in the past when there's so many things that we have done to build that sense of community that we just can't do in the same way this year. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we're focusing on is how do we maintain traditions um, and adjust them so that we can do them safely? Um, you know, how do we do our turkey trot, which we've actually done virtually. So we've, we have, we've been able to do some of these things. How do we maintain our international festival? Um, when we can't bring everyone together um, in the way that we used to. Um, we're also really trying to look for ways to ensure that um, our remote academy and our quarantine classes remain connected because we don't want them to feel like, although they are sort of the remote academy as a school within a school, we don't want it to feel that way. We want them to feel like they belong to Alcott, Thoreau, or Willard. Um, and so, so part of our work around this goal is ensuring that no matter um, what uh, modality children are learning and that they feel connected and included. Um, and so some of the ways that we're looking at that, um, we have students integrated for their specialty classes. So even though they may belong to the remote cohort, um, they are uh, integrated for specials. We're looking for ways, and this, there's a lot of overlap um, between the, the well-being goal and the inclusive culture goal, um, but how do we use room parents differently this year to try to increase um, connection. Um, and so that's, that's sort of one, one facet. The other facet is how do we continue, um, the really important work that we've done, um, around inclusive culture so that all students feel, um, like members of our community and like they belong regardless of their race, their linguistic background, um, their gender identity, their ability or disability. So the work that we've been doing, um, the work that I actually think that you heard, um, quite a bit about it, uh, the, the presentation um, at school committee a couple weeks ago. So how do we continue that in, um, in these current times? So, and, and that, um, in, in that regard, some of the things that are happening is that um, all three of the elementary principals and several of our staff members are all members of the Cultural Competency Committee. Um, we're participating in um, we're engaging in a literature review that's focused on assessing bias and representation um, in our curriculum. Um, and, and just all of that work that we would be doing under normal circumstances, we're really committed to making sure that we are continuing it because it is, it's one sort of focus that, um, we, we, that cannot, we cannot, we can't afford to not do that work just because there's a pandemic. Um, and so this goal really doesn't in, incorporate both of those facets. Um, and then the, the last piece is just, um, really soliciting and applying feedback from, from families. Um, and so we've had a first round of surveys and, and looked at that. Um, and then we plan to continue to just make sure that we are really uh, taking feedback and applying it and making adjustments as needed. Um, so that that is the inclusive culture. Um, I may just, if Angel and Matt are okay, since I'm the one with my microphone on, I might lead us into innovative environment. And then the, the three of us are sort of bouncing off this last one. Um, so the innovative environment, we will rethink and redesign uh, the physical and educational spaces to accommodate the demands of teaching and learning during a global pandemic. So you've heard a little bit of this um, already in some of the other um, 
and some of the other goals. Um, but, but when we think of innovative environment this year, we're thinking about the physical space and there's a lot of ways that we've had to repurpose physical space, but we're also thinking about um, sort of the educational spaces. And so one thing um, that everyone at the elementary level is working on um, is implementing totally new educational platforms that they, they experimented with in the spring, but they are really um, embracing and, and using this year. So Seesaw and, and Google Classroom um, and just being one-to-one one uh, devices right now at the elementary school um, was not something that existed previously. Um, and so all of that is really new and just involves a lot of professional development around it. Um, and just uh, to, to reiterate what Matt said earlier, people are just, they're really going with it um, and really just exploring these new um, educational tools and really using them to be able to um, to teach no matter what the environment, to teach whether they're in person or remote. Um, I'm not sure, Matt or Angel, who wants to go next? Um, sure, I, I don't mind jumping in. Yeah. Um, so I would say that we have all, the amount of, like, like Naomi said, the amount of professional development our staff identified that they needed and then participated in is was mind boggling this summer. There was so much work and there continues to be so much work, like Matt and Lori had mentioned earlier in the meeting about our professional development days. Um, the rich learning experiences that our student or that our teachers and faculty have um, completed, I would say, you know, from summer through now and they continue to is just amazing and inspiring. Um, and I've really, I don't know, I'm sure that, that Naomi and Matt have also appreciated joining them for those, for some of those sessions, learning a lot about how to um, teach and learn and lead in this new environment. Um, I would say that um, one of the, one of the challenges, but also good things that we've had to figure out beyond just the physical space of the building was um, knowing that um, students needed to be outside for the mornings at some point. Uh, teachers have been in incredibly creative about figuring out how they can take their curriculum units and lessons outdoors uh, to allow students to spend some more time outside and to connect with nature. Um, and I would say that, you know, another fun uh, thing that I think has come as a just a result of not being able to visit some of the field trip sites that we visited in the past was that um, places like the Concord Museum, the Alcott Museum, um, and you know Museum of Science are all um, creating virtual field trips for students. And we're still finding ways to continue to complete our units on Blanding's Turtles. Um, and they're just looking a little bit different. So we're really trying to be creative and tap into as many and partner with as many of the organizations as we have in the past to uh, bring the places that we used to visit uh, to our students in a virtual environment. And you yeah. want to talk about space, Matt? Sure, I'm happy to. Thanks, Angel. And so lastly, so when we were um, coming back to school, we're really in phase one. How do we get the schools open, uh, safe? How do we convince uh, and prove to all our stakeholders that they that it is a place where learning can occur and um, in a safe environment. So now we're at phase two, where now we're up and rolling and um, we're hitting our mark, but now situations are changing. So whether that's we're seeing an uptick in COVID itself and then uh, additional quarantining that may be um, taking effect, or it might be the arrival. Um, so what we're doing now is constantly changing as we move into phase two, which means uh, using different spaces within our buildings for different reasons. Um, and uh, I think if there's another um, very strong uh, lesson that all of us are learning is that we need to remain humble, we need to remain open, and we need to be uh, always listening to all our constituencies because often the idea uh, of the of the group is better than the idea of the single individual. So um, whether it's coming from staff or parents or um, or our colleagues or the students, often um, we're using spaces um, um, wisely and in safe uh, manner, and we're using it uh, differently today than we did at the start of the school year. So it's certainly not a static year. But I think you'll find that the plan that we propose for you for your approval is one that is fairly comprehensive and one that is targeted to meet the needs of our students during these very difficult times. Thank you on behalf of the elementary school principals for listening to our report. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, to all three of you. Uh, 
Uh, do we have questions at this point? Questions, comments, the principals? Well, I, I, I'll I be happy to lead off. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about STAR 360. Uh, I'm guessing this is uh, some kind of web-based dashboard that uh, will uh, um, uh, reveal data uh, about a student's math and what is it, math and reading progress. Um, at the elementary school, most of that's coming from the lead teacher, the classroom teacher. Who else has uh, access to it and how does it expand uh, 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 the, the transmission of information uh, about a child such that uh, interventions happen at, the, at a more timely way than they might have been without that instrument? Sure, so I think it's, um, I'd be happy to talk about the implementation elementary, but Chris, and I think you, your overarching um, uh, explanation might be important to begin with. Oh, great, okay, yeah. So. Um, we've had for many years good RTI system for um, catching students if they fall a little bit behind or a lot behind the curriculum and then remediating them in reading and math in particular. Um, and so when we've looked to add those systems at the middle school a couple of years ago and at the high school, uh, we were looking for a tool where we could um, very quickly assess all the kids. So it's called a screener. Um, and we currently give a star 360 in all of our English classes for reading and all of our math classes for uh, math in grades uh, six through 10. It, it depends on how high we go up in the high school years. Um, so uh, with the advent of um, coronavirus, we were looking for a similar technological tool that we could implement um, at the elementary level because we didn't know if we were actually going to be in person um, in order to administer our um, our traditional uh, reading assessments and math assessments, um, which were all done one on one. So we were looking for sort of a big um, screener that could be given all at once, identify kids who are struggling, and then just with those students, dig in deeper with more accurate, um, specific measures. So, so that's what we've done. So we now are kindergarten through all the way through high school, giving STARS 360. Uh, the great part of that. Um, is it takes half an hour or something like that to administer. Uh, it's you know not hard. Um, the great part of that is that we now can have the data uh, talk from one level to the next, meaning fifth grade to sixth grade, ninth grade or eighth grade to ninth grade. Um, and the reason that you can give it so quickly is that there's artificial intelligence built in, meaning if a kid is getting um, two or three questions right in a row, you get slightly harder question, slightly harder question. Um, if they are getting um, two or three wrong in a row, then you get a slightly easier question. And so that's how we can pinpoint um, over 40 skills in reading and math um, and sort of see where they struggle, but also if we can kind of figure out their level. So is that what you were looking for, Matt? Just in terms yeah. of it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then our classroom teachers use this information coupled with the other available um, um, progress monitoring tools to identify gaps, um, then uh, to apply um, uh, interventions, um, as well as flexibly grouping kids for reading or math instruction during the day. And the part that's been, oh, sorry. Do, the, Go ahead, Naomi. The part that I think has been really helpful this year um, is that it can be given in either environment. So our kids that are in our remote academy were able to take it in the fall, and our kids that were in person were able to as well. Um, and so we're able to have the same data regardless of what the learning environment is. Um, and so it means that, you know, if a class is quarantining during the winter assessment window, we can still do it. Um, and it, because the, the assessments that we would, we were using in person prior to the pandemic, um, you couldn't give if a kid was at home, you really had to do them face to face. So it allows us, um, it allows us to know how kids are doing regardless of their learning environment. That, that very much confirms my guess, and it was only a guess, that uh, one of the huge values is that the information travels with the student, even if uh, she or he changes their learning uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. 
Um, I'd love to ask a question too. It follows up a little bit on the um, the tracking tools, the um, evaluation tools. But I, I know that one of the conversations that we had had back in the spring was about the fact that, oh, there might need to be catch up in the fall for the previous year. And that as we got into this year, um, that was part of, the, part of what all of you have been doing, I know, is figuring out what gaps there were and how to fill them. Um, and I'm assuming that this tool has helped in that. And so I guess the overall question is kind of, how much of that has been done or has been needed even? So was it, did it feel like a big catch up mission because of the spring or did it feel like just a few small holes to fill here and there? Heather, it depends on the subject area, but I would say we've been pleasantly surprised by how little catch up we've had to do. Right. Um, you know, I would say that the easier areas um, were in reading and writing where there's, there's some discrete skills, um, but there's overall a general sort of way that you do those things. Right. Um, you know, where kids were a little bit more behind uh, than you would have expected um, if we had been in person would be where there are a lot of discrete little skills. So, you know, math, we didn't cover as much as we had. Um, so it really helps that in kindergarten through grade six, we had a spiraling curriculum. So you don't have to go back. You just right. pick it up, right? And you just start right in September where you would have. And so it spirals to all those skills. So I would say we've been pleasantly surprised. Um, and, um, I, you know, thank you to all the parents for supporting because I think kids were learning in the spring, right. uh, and that really, really helped. I would just add on to that. Um, there weren't many surprises. It was actually really affirming to look at the data when we received it at how in line and that the current data was with the trajectory that the students were on who we've had in previous years. Obviously, we don't have prior data for kindergarten students who are new to us, but we, we were surprised by how few surprises there were. <laughs> That makes sense. Yeah. And Heather, if I could just make a tangential uh, comment based on uh, uh, what Kristen was just mentioned about parents, um, all three of the elementary school principals um, uh, speak regularly about our gratitude for the parents, the flexibility, the commitment of our parents has been extraordinary. Uh, and it hasn't been easy for parents to... Um, you know, to, to, to play catch up constantly on what we're doing, how we're doing it and getting word out to them. So um, I need to, we wanted to make sure that all our parents knew how grateful we were uh, for the support of the staff and their understanding and their flexibility and their honesty and their uh, fortitude to fight the good fight and to reduce uh, risk by staying in town and by uh, foregoing events. Um, and if they are going to do something or they're open and honest about it and they say, we're going to go get a test. So it's the work of the community as a whole and the parents specifically who are enabling us to stay open. Um, so it's, uh, it's part of a, a larger effort, but we're very, very grateful for the parents work. And this is a question to all of you. Um, how difficult do you think the parents have found the remote learning using the tools, Seesaw, et cetera? Have they, do they feel like they can get technical support when they need it? And how do you handle that? Any of you? Uh, it might be answered in the survey uh, responses uh, that we have later. Well, I'm um, really interested. Elementary kids are obviously, they're, they're somewhat technically, <laughs> uh, I mean, I work in a school, so I know that I think I see the most issues with Seesaw. Um, and I, are you guys using Clever or no? No, no. So I don't want to. I don't want to glom the conversation here. But I can tell you what's happening is that the the support of the parents has been really quite strong by our technology specialists, mm -hmm. and we have teachers who uh, are designing work that is accessible to our kids at home. Good. Uh, so it's not to say there are there haven't been a couple uh, hiccups from time to time, Cynthia. But um, when there have been issues that have risen then our technology staff immediately gets back to the uh, parent. Um, but even the first layer of triage is that uh, remote learning uh, academy teacher who, because they've been trained and they have the PD and they're using the platform regularly, can often answer the question for the parent right away. Yeah, that's so it's, it's, it's been working very well. Good. 
Uh, just to follow up on your specific question about clever, we don't use it at the elementary level, but we do at the middle school and high school. Gotcha. Okay. Other comments, questions? Well, you and your teaching staff uh, and all, all your building staff have done an admirable job. We, uh, we hope you have a, a safe week between now and a well-deserved break. Uh, and we're very grateful for you uh, putting together the plans uh, in such a careful way and reviewing them with us tonight. Thank you. Rest up. <laughs> Thank you. And I would just, the, one last comment is just that I'm amazed and that you, you know, it, I know we're going to speak to all of you, but to the three, in case the three of you are leaving, we were talking about everyday heroes and, and this goes to all of you, all the principals. I mean, everything you're doing, you guys are everyday heroes and we are indebted to you for how well this year is going. And we, we just need to say that because we owe you a lot um, and a lot of gratitude and thank you so, so much. Here, here. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so I think we're going to turn to you, Mr. Cameron. Good evening. Thank you. Um, so, on behalf of the Middle School School Advisory Council or School Council, which consists of uh, five teachers, five parents, uh, two of those teachers um, have not been standing members just yet for various reasons. Um, almost as importantly, though, for the first year ever, we have five students a part of our school advisory council uh, for the 2021 school year. Um, so here's a snapshot of each. Uh, like the elementary school, uh, the plan is really built upon the strategic initiatives, um, the district improvement plan, which includes the multiple paths to success, well-being, inclusive culture, innovative environment. I was listening to the elementary presentation. I don't think I've ever heard the words negative pressure ventilation system in a school improvement <laughs> plan ever in the history of school improvement plans. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, share some highlights and share some of the great work. Um, I do think it's very appropriate that within seven words of our plan this year, uh, the word teacher and support is there. Um, I really do think, you know, rebranding a school improvement plan to more of a school support plan is probably a little bit more appropriate in these times. Uh, so multiple paths to success starts with supporting our, our teachers. Um, right now, our teachers here at the middle school are in their sixth hour of parent-teacher conferences um, happening through Zoom. They're entering into a whole new dimension of Zoom fatigue. Uh, they started those parent-teacher conferences at noontime today. Um, so a support of all of our teachers and educators, um, I would say, you know, we're finding our tutors and our support staff system and our special educators and our guidance counselors working just as hard um, and a focus on all of our educator uh, well-being um, is a central focus. Um, the middle school, like the elementary school and like CCHS, um, is really focused on data-driven instruction. Um, we also have STAR 360 in place for both math and reading. Um, like the high school, though, we also have a social and emotional screener called PAIR, um, and that allows us to monitor in real time um, students in their uh, social and emotional well-being. Um, the pair assessment is a strengths-based assessment. Um, it allows us to focus on um, what the students are bringing every day to the classroom um, and not just the deficits and areas in which they might need intervention, but areas in which they bring strengths to the middle school. Um, and that allows us to group our students um, in some strength-based programming um, in our intervention block. Our intervention and enrichment block um, just three years ago were about um, four or five classes per grade. Uh, now we're above about 25 classes uh, that are offering intervention and enrichment offerings. Um, all of them are grouped through the data that we get through PAIR and STAR. Uh, well-being along with the elementary schools um, we are focused, and the students who sit on not only student council, but the school advisory council, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, really focused on um, 
making sure that there are ample opportunities of students coming together for social reasons um, with all the proper um, safety measures in place. Um, I recall very fondly a Zoom that uh, the student council was doing and visiting other school districts this summer and trying to get an understanding um, of what other schools, how their reopening plans look like. And I remember um, sometime in mid-August when a member of our student council, an eighth grader, you know, ask, uh, asked another principal if the, what they were planning for their after-school program. And the principal seemed to be kind of shocked and said, well, to be honest, we're not gonna have it. Um, it doesn't seem prudent during these times. And uh, I really measured the nonverbal Zoom offers that opportunity, right, to really focus in on the camera. And I remember the nonverbal and disappointment that washed over that student. Um, now, I have to say, uh, you know, I offer that student a great amount of um, compliments that they carried over that moment uh, to inform our reopening plan and making sure that our after-school um, activities and our after-school program, which I believe is one of the most robust that you will ever see, we doubled down on it. Um, in the fall, we offered such opportunities as um, bike riding, cycling. Um, we've never offered that before. Um, it was intentional this year. Um, and we've also, um, just this week, we have announced some outdoor clubs that are happening um, outside in the winter time you know, really taking from the research of how dark it gets um, and how difficult this time of year can be anyways. Um, starting in January, when we return, we're offering an outdoor hiking club, a winter hiking club um, to our students. Um, and we've found that both our um, outdoor and indoor in-person activities are being attended by uh, students from all three groups, all the two alphabet groups um, and some students um, who are all virtual or all remote. Um, inclusive culture, uh, along with the elementary schools, the middle school is prioritizing um, intervention needs for um, our high needs populations. You heard Dr. Hunter um, maybe about 30 minutes ago mention that both the high school and the middle school um, have offered up entrance criteria for students um, who may have struggled in the first trimester of learning um, and offering up an opportunity um, for more students to come through the doors four or five days a week. Um, we prioritize that in just the last couple weeks. Um, we'll be offering that to a select number of students who meet that criteria um, in January upon the return of all students and staff from the winter recess. Um, we are moving forward in our, I believe our sixth year um, in our PLC of the CMS Allies Group, which is our cultural competency professional learning community. Um, our number of teachers and staff tutors um, have um, probably doubled uh, since we started meeting in the spring through Zoom. Um, the opportunity for more involvement and engagement from our teachers and staff um, with the flexibility that Zoom does give us, um, allowed us to rethink, you know, when those meetings happened and um, in what format as well. Uh, the middle school also has, or the School Advisory Council, which again authored this plan, has a couple working groups. Um, one of the working groups is to look at the work that we've done um, with the Project 351 um, cultural, con uh, cultural Competency Playbook. Uh, that is a professional development or workshop that equips um, anyone who attends a workshop with um, how to um, be ready, be at the, you know, socially ready for um, any opportunities for um, dialogue um, under the umbrella of cultural competency. So if it's a student who hears a racial slur on a bus, or if it's a staff um, that overhears something um, that, you know, may not be intentional uh, from a student um, because of the age that we work at, but certainly has impact, we want to make sure that our entire community is at the ready. Uh, we left the playbook work, um, if you recall, um, in March of 2020, February of 2020, excuse me, um, 
offering up a community-wide training uh, that school committee members, the chief of police, our uh, school resource officer, teachers and parents all came together in uh, the sixth grade building in the Peabody gym. Um, we're actually looking to offer that um, to all of our staff, um, including um, opening it up to all of our um, food service staff, our building service staff, our bus drivers, our tutors, those who we feel and students have named um, that are often in more uh, the front line and to when these things happen than even teachers often. Finally, uh, under the umbrella of innovation, um, the middle school has opened um, almost, it was a, pretty much a happy accident. Um, you know, we shared out a Zoom link uh, that happened to be my personal Zoom room um, on the first day of school to help students um, and parents orient to this new world we're in. Um, and I don't know if you've ever uh, had this experience, but when people show up to your Zoom room and you're not there, you receive emails uh, saying so-and-so is in your Zoom room. And for the first couple of days it was happening, I couldn't imagine why. Um, and then some parents and students would follow up and said, you know, we were in help desk or the virtual main office, uh, and in which case we looked at each other as a leadership team at the middle school and said, well, since the demand is there, um, you know, even though the intent was just for the first day, let's have this open and let's try to sustain this. And, and it has. In fact, as I'm speaking to you right now, um, help desk in virtual main office has been open to our parents um, because all our parents are in Zoom conferences um, as we are speaking. Uh, finally, the middle school created a temporary website that can be very quickly updated. Um, and we have also put together um, for uh, the many families that find themselves even more busy in a pandemic, um, a weekly recap email in case they've um, missed anything here at the middle school. Questions? I hope, you know, I have, I have no response, so I hope, hope I'm still on. <laughs> yes? Yes, that was great. <laughs> If you would, tell us about the temporary website. Is this a quick way of uh, doing edit announcements that will go out uh, without going through the school portal just as a time saver? Is that what it's about? Um, yeah. And, you know, we also found many things that were on our website that we're going to look to return to when the pandemic lifts um, weren't actually accurate in the time that we're in right now. Um, so, you know, we made a pretty quick decision sometime. It was um, the reopening task force. You know, we had kind of a, a subgroup that just focused on communication. You know, um, how do we communicate all of these plans out to our families? Um, you know, following the greatness that is, is Matt Lucy, we created a lot of social story videos, um, wrote a lot of videos about how the reopening would look like from the perspective of the students. Um, but we also talked about um, putting together a comprehensive um, temporary website uh, that would have all of the information, you know, so that every page you go on on this temporary website was information about the reality that we're in, we were in. But as the school improvement plan said as well, you know, it's much easier to update. Um, in fact, um, it's a Google site. If you know anything about Google sites, you know, if you're updating a Google Doc for parents, like our daily announcements are updated on the Google Doc, um, that is a live update to the Google site as well. There's nothing else you need to do. There's no back room you need to go in. There's no WordPress, you know, what's my login. Um, it's just a lot more, um, it's cleaner, I guess I would say. And taking a look at it, if we go to the original URL, then it's a one click away to the Google site, if I'm correct. Good, thank you. Comments, questions for Mr. Cameron? Question, please. Yes, um, please. I am going to be that student who asked the principal about after school programs in the pandemic. Um, I, I, I'm asking this because um, I, I feel so fortunate to be surrounded uh, by so much competency and uh, 
Uh, it's about an initiative that is near and dear to my heart, and I wonder uh, how the pandemic has uh, impacted it and what does it look like this year? Um, and that would be a challenge success at the middle school. And it goes for the high school when the high school turn comes up. Uh, so how does challenge success look like this year at CMS? Yep. So we've been engaging in conversations and, you know, I actually sent an email to Dr. Hunter and Kristen as well. You know, the challenge success work um, is actually embedded and informed a lot of the decisions that we made, um, you know, in the reopening. Um, and where I think I may have started, you know, running ahead of both Dr. Hunter and Kristen um, is I sent them an email about a week ago, and I said there are many things that are present right now in the reality we're in that we're going to um, wrap our our hands around and have white knuckles to take with us. And let me give you a concrete example. Um, in the Challenge Success Conference that I attended, um, the first workshop that I found myself in was if you're really committed to this work, um, you have to, in a hackathon kind of way, tear down your master schedule and build it up brand new. Um, and you have to commit yourself to such important times for the emotional well being of your students of passing time increasing the amount of passing time you give your students, allowing to, them to breathe. If your recess, if you have one at, at middle school, and we do, and we champion that, um, if it's attached to your lunch and that lunch is towards, you know, kind of the back end of, of, your, of the student's day, build a recess, you know, sometime after the first couple periods. Um, we've done that this year. Um, you know, those are two examples you know, of the permission that the pandemic has given us, you know, to implement things that um, challenge success really taught us. Um, and as I said, you know, we're looking to make sure that when the pandemic lifts and we're looking at our master schedule of next year and we've received such positive feedback, you know, about our increased passing time, you know, having recess, more social opportunities, giving students a chance to, you know, just breathe and, and be children. Um, those are things we want to make sure we take with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Justin, I have a quick question. I think it's a quick question and then a comment. Um, as a, I am a parent of a sixth grader, as you know, and, and he's doing great and transitioning well. But my question is more on a general basis. What has been different in terms of transitioning the sixth graders into the middle school? But I say a quick question, you probably go on for hours about this. So the high level version of, um, you know, transitioning the sixth graders in, um, you know, what's been different besides the obvious and, and how have you dealt with it and how do you think that's going? How are the sixth graders doing? Yep, um, well, I'll start off by saying, you know, thank goodness for the reconfiguration. Um, yeah. you, know, I, I, you know, when we entered the school closure in the spring, it may have taken me a day um, to reach out to Dr. Hunter and say, my gosh, if we were looking to reconfigure for 2021, you know, would we? Um, and I don't think we would. So, you know, everything is about timing, of course. Um, and the fact that we were just, well, not quite ending, right? Because, you know, we were let out of school was still about a third of the school year left. But as the committee knows, last year was the first full year of the PBD building being a sixth grade building um, and the Sanborn building being a seventh and eighth grade building. What we found this year um, is the opportunity that sixth graders have their own space and their own opportunity to find their way in middle school. Um, that own space being theirs, uh, could not be more important. Um, and we're finding that in us in our second year of the reconfiguration. You know, the one thing that um, we are still focused on, and we're looking to increase opportunities again, like the after school program, but also, you know, in Zoom level assemblies and home base and advisory is playing such an important role. And my goodness, I forgot to mention um, in Fatima's. Um, question, we also increased dramatically our time that our students are in advisory. Um, and that time has made all the difference. I will say one um, 
area that we still want to support um, and a concern, I suppose, um, is the three elementary schools coming together, you know, as one, I think has been a little bit more difficult, um, you know, in a pandemic and having some of those students be virtual for five days a week and the alphabet groups not together as well. Um, you know, again, I believe that is the role of grade level ce celebrations that we're looking to have and the PTG is looking to support us in that come, um, you know, mid to late winter and through the spring as well. Um, and then times, um, you know, in advisory and such. Great. It certainly seems to be going very well, though. Um, I can say from experience. And then I will just say, also from experience, because I was on those very conferences that you were talking about for the two hours leading up to this meeting. And I just have to say, I was completely blown away there as well. And the enthusiasm and engagement from those teachers, even though they're on Zoom all the time and they were doing this with parent after parent after parent for seven minutes at a time, um, every conversation I had was just so in inspiring and engaged and enthusiastic and kudos to all the teachers for all that they're doing out there right now. And, and repeat the comment to you about Everyday Heroes, because that was to all of you. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Justin, how heavily utilized was the uh, virtual main office? Or is, I should say. Yep, yep. Um, it's, it's pretty utilized. Um, you know, I would say depending, you know, I feel like, you know, we kind of lost... Um, you know, a little bit with, you know, Thanksgiving, the holidays coming, we didn't have school today. So, you know, whenever we offer, you know, that kind of wonky schedule, you know, snowstorm coming in, you know, we find we're finding an uptick in students mm -hmm. coming to help desk. Um, you know, in a normal week when we have a rhythm and a routine, you know, I want to say it's probably one student or, you know, per hour maybe or one every couple hours. Uh, we started off doing a logbook, um, you know, really for those staff that were staffing help desk yeah. to look for themes and an understanding of what, you know, everyone could expect. Um, but we found the demand, again, not impossible, but so high that we, we couldn't keep up with the logbook. Um, it's interesting because it can be the same students. And there's a couple students who, you know, I joke with like, you know, they almost have like a subway card and, you know, it's like you, you burned a ninth, you know, your ninth visit to help desk, you burned a free sub. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good idea. And, uh, you know, maybe some of these things we might keep, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. Yeah. That's what we got to figure out. Actually, I was, I was staffing help desk and, um, it has a waiting room because that's a security feature, of course, in any Zooms. And there was somebody from um, uh, the Lexington School District that was in the waiting room. And I was just like, eh, this just doesn't feel right, even though it was just me. It was, you know. So finally, I get an email um, saying, you know, hey, I'm on this thing that I heard about that people are talking about in Lexington, and I'm hoping to talk to somebody about it. Um, so I ended up letting the person on, and they were like, tell me about help desk. They're like, thank you very much. So what do you do? Are you a tutor here? They said to me, <laughs> oh, no, I'm actually doing a couple other things as well. <laughs> I like it. Well done. All right. Well, we hope you'll extend our thanks to uh, the team that worked with you on the plan. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you for being here tonight and uh, giving us such an excellent presentation. And uh, as we said to the elementary uh, principals, uh, uh, be careful and uh, get get to the break safely. Uh, you you and your faculty and your students uh, take good care and hope you have a restful uh, holiday. Thank you, Court. Thank you, Mr. Mistrullo. All right. Well, now this is when I just hope and pray that the dogs have been really quiet this entire time remain <laughs> quiet. Uh, I am home alone, so if they um, go ballistic, we're all in for a treat here. And I must say, I also feel a little bit like uh, when we do graduation practice, uh, you know, the poor students with the last name that begins with Z. Uh, you know, I always seem to go last here, and that's okay because I love following my colleagues. But, you know, I do allow them on the second day of practice to leave early the Z's. Uh, so, you know, maybe we can allow the, the high school to go first at some point. No, but I'm joking. <laughs> 
um, you know, proud to follow, um, you know, my colleagues and, you know, just let's just keep uh, expectations really low. Um, I, I've been up since four and unlike Kristen and Lori, I actually get tired and yawn. So I'm going to do my best here. But um, I guess I would start very briefly just by thanking you, uh, Lori, Kristen, you know, her entire team, um, the school committee, the community, you know, the, the amount of effort. Um, and the need for sustained and increasing efforts to make this all work, it, you know, it's, it's pretty significant and it does take a lot of sacrifice. And there's a lot of sacrifice that lay ahead, a lot of challenges that lay ahead. But I will say that I'm really proud of the work to date. I'm so proud of the staff and the students um, because it does take uh, quite an effort to make this work every single day. Um, and uh, you know, one of the, uh, the, the silver linings in this um, pandemic is that you know, the uh, job alike groups for principals have really moved to the virtual world, which allows me to take part. And now I take part in three. And before I was, I, I didn't take part in any. It was just too hard. Um, and I can tell you that, um, you know, just listening to my, my peers and neighboring schools that, uh, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who's doing it better. It's not perfect. You know, always can be improved. Uh, but overall, there's the first part. Uh, overall, things are going really well. And, and I think it's a testament to the kids in the school to the teachers in the school, to the staff. I mean, just the amount of adaptability that's taken place is amazing. And I, and I'm just kind of harkening back to what Angel said, talking about how it's just everything is going to look different and really not knowing how people are going to adapt to it. Uh, I would say the same. The Learning Commons at our school was the social place uh, when you walked into the school all day, really. And then we had reconfigured. You would have to walk through there almost like you know a salmon going upstream. It was just packed. And that obviously had to change. And now we have desks six feet apart where kids are zooming in to their, their class. And we worried if they could adapt. And it, it was never once an issue. So I'm just really proud of all uh, everybody. And, uh, you know, one more thing. I went to a class today, Vicki Moskowitz, who's a really, really talented English teacher. Um, and I watched student presentations. They were doing an analysis of the Scarlet Letter. Um, and I, I just, I just cannot get over these kids continually impress and just how not only how they adapt to the environment, um, but really it was seamless. The presentations were great. Their analysis was just they're so far and above and beyond where, oh, certainly where I was at, at their age. It's it's quite impressive. So, um, you know, with that being said, I'm going to start with um, the ninth grade academy. Um, so last year, you might recall, we did a little bit of a road show. Um, really selling a ninth grade academy and, 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 you know, I don't mean to use the term sell, really trying to pitch and let people understand, you know, why we were looking to do ninth grade differently. And, you know, we all recognize that ninth grade is an extremely challenging year for a variety of reasons, not only academics, but, you know, just the social and the just growing up. And so it's a really crucial year. And we found that for the most part, we were treating them um, you know, just like after some initiatives in the beginning of the year, just like 25% of the school. And, um, you know, that we, we, we now know that, um, you know, we've, we've cited the Washington Post article many times that um, high-performing districts are labeled as an at-risk group now. And so we really wanted to be um, uh, just, um, just, just make sure that we were on board, onboarding kids in a very thoughtful, systematic way. And there was some talk when the pandemic hit that maybe we shouldn't do ninth grade academy. And we did forge ahead because there was so much work that was done. We did scale some things back. There's no question. And in the end, I'm so glad that we did. I, and we could never do this in terms of the entire high school. It's just not possible. With that being said, um, it was more crucial this year because, um, you know, we have four team leaders, uh, Teresa Rosario, Ray Pavlik, Ben Kendall, Will Camesa, they're you know, in charge of each one of a different cohort. And Robin uh, Cicchetti, who's been fantastic, kind of oversees it all. Uh, you know, but just getting their feedback. So this has really been a shining star in a, in a year that is really hard to find a lot of those. Um, and just hearing them speak about um, how the fact that they know their kids more, how they've collaborated. It's easier to collaborate. Their team meetings, they know the kids. They've been able to try. You know, we're really using the ninth grade as an incubator. Um, to try new things and we're encouraging them to take risks and they don't all have to do it. They could try different things and different cohorts. So, so goal number one is to improve practices to ease, ease student transitions from one school to another and one town to another and fully implement the best practices for a ninth grade education and support students and staff of the ninth grade academy. So again, we really just try to use it as an incubator, see what's going well, 
with a focus on um, relationships and onboarding the kids in a manner that is allows them to adapt to high school. So every student first quarter was given a pass fail grade. It wasn't an option in the first quarter. It was just, that's what it was gonna be. With that being said, they have the choice at the end of the year to go back and say, okay, does that actually help my, my overall grade? And if it does, great, you can, you can uh, use it. If it doesn't, and that's okay too. We factor in the other three grading periods. And really that was to take the pressure off of trying to, for, trying to adapt to high school and perform well academically um, and really just trying to focus, you know, on, on relationships. Um, and I think their weekly meetings um, with the team have, have just been fantastic. Um, and, you know, we continue to collect data and we'll see what's working well and, and what isn't. And, um, um, and so one other thing I'd point out that later in the presentation, but that we've, we recently, similar to the middle school, have invited students back and we developed criteria to invite students back um, really as an intervention we know that all kids could benefit from being in, in school full time every day. You know, the COVID um, safety measures just doesn't allow that. We can do it safely on a, on a limited scale. So we only focused on 10 through 12 because the ninth grade academy teachers, without being prompted, without knowing that we were even doing this, submitted a list of students that they thought could benefit from being full time. So we didn't even have to, to you know, entertain ninth grade. They did it. They advocated for it. And so we invited, you know, close to 44 students to come back. Not everyone took advantage of the opportunity for obvious reasons, but I think it speaks to the dedication of those teachers, um, their recognition that it's it, it's helpful to have students in person. Um, if some kids, all kids could benefit, as I said, but some kids could really benefit. And so, you know, we're using as an intervention. We'll evaluate in nine weeks. Um, and so just really excited about the Ninth Grade Academy. I think it's been, uh, so far, it's been fantastic. So. Um, kudos to all those that have made that happen. Uh, you know, the second one I won't spend too much time on because it, it really um, has already been discussed at length by the other schools, but implement tiered levels of support to meet the academic and social emotional behavior and needs of all students. We are also using the same universal screeners that were outlined in um, previous presentations. And it's really about targeted interventions for students um, that we can monitor progress and we don't allow things to get too far down the road before we identify a problem. We recognize that there are some gaps that need to be filled. We can provide targeted interventions in math and reading um, and then assess you know, progress you know, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, we're in year, really year three of this, really two of it being fully implemented. Katie Stahl is one of the assistant principals, has so done a fantastic job. Um, with RTI and, you know, really excited. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of unique that we're doing it at the high school. It's, it's oftentimes an initiative that you see more at the elementary schools and less so at the middle school and high school level. So, you know, uh, Kristen has really um, been the impetus behind that. And I, I know nudged me along um, and quickly made me a believer. And I'm glad that we're, that we're doing it. Uh, I would say the next goal is really a direct result of COVID. And so it's, it's important that we always collect feedback from all stakeholders, um, you know, we, and as a matter of fact, we develop goals for educators to adopt only if they want to. It's on a voluntary basis. So we've developed about six or seven over the years, actually closer to 10, one of which is about feedback. Uh, but this year we are making a concerted effort along with the superintendent to collect feedback from students, staff, students, and parents regarding their experiences during the 2020-21 school year, analyze and, and integrate information from their perspectives into our daily operations to maximize learning and enhance the experiences for all students, staff, and parents. You know, uh, we've done, there was a lot of planning, obviously, prior to the start of the school year. You know, that continues, you know, but these are going to take adaptations. And it's sometimes it's hard to figure out the experience of each individual um, when they're only coming in half the time, or they're fully remote, or a teacher's fully remote. So it's important, I think, that we keep a pulse and see how folks are doing, seek recommendations for improvement. And, you know, I think there's been, um, you know, several instances where we, we have made some adjustments based on the feedback. And, you know, oftentimes the students are, are the ones that are coming up with uh, the best ideas. So, you know, we'll continue this practice. Um, uh, we've, uh, I think, Kristen tonight, or maybe the pre, I think it's tonight actually, um, you know, is doing detailed presentation on some of the feedback. And so, um, you know, we're going to continue that work at the high school level as well. Um, you know, these, these goals are certainly in no order. Um, and the last one really is a continuation from 
from last year and create a collaborative and inclusive culture at CCHS in the community that values diversity and recognizes the contributions and uniqueness of each person. I will say that, um, you know, I'm thrilled, can't say enough about Andrew Amici, his, just his leadership has been outstanding. And, you know, some of the things I'm excited about this year are, are really student driven. Um, you know, we, we, we have the formation um, uh, of uh, the BSU and also Intersections Club. And so there's been a lot of grassroots um, uh, efforts to make change at the school and, uh, and done in a, in a very thoughtful, um, professional, respectful way. Um, and so, you know, excited about that. Um, you know, I think we've been really thoughtful um, that we're looking for high quality educators with a diverse background. And we've had some great success. There's a lot, there's, there's thousands out there that are supremely qualified. And it's our job to convince them that Concord's a place for them uh, and to make sure that we are not only recruiting, but helping to make sure that they, uh, that they feel welcome and that they, they stay with us. So, you know, excited about all four of these. It's certainly not everything that's going on in school, um, but really just overall can't say enough about, um, you know, the students and the staff and how teachers have adapted and how students have adapted. It's been, it's been quite impressive to watch and, and really inspiring in many ways. Happy to take uh, questions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. They, um, I mean, congratulations with all, all the work with the, I mean, ninth grade Academy half. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's fantastic. I just have a question about, um, uh, about the supports because I know that, that, um, Linda and Amy have sort of referenced the, that this year isn't like normal where kids don't have that who are in that middle group or, or, aren't, you know, actively getting supports that the uh, options for going in for math support or, or those kinds of things aren't there as they normally are. Um, how is that? How's that playing out in the school right now? Yeah. So you, you named a, a problem that we, we recognized um, immediately, you know, we planned for it, right? So we are, you know, and this is, this is my fifth year and I can recall, um, you know, one of the more impressive things when I was, you know, reviewing the school at the time was the mark and the cert, which is your math support, your social studies and your English support, where you would have a drop in place with dedicated people there. Kids could drop in and get support. Now they could be assigned there as well. Um, but that to me was just, it blew me away. I mean, those, those types of uh, interventions and resources uh, are not uh, very typical. Um, with that being said, COVID doesn't make that possible. You know, we, we had to be really thoughtful about the number of students that could just drop in. So I can tell you some of the things that we did do, starting with number one is we wanted to make sure that teachers were the front line of all extra support, extra help, and that we you know, went through some tutorials about how best to use um, like a sign up, uh, for, for example, how do you sign up with the teacher using Google Calendar you know, to set up an appointment for, um, um, for some additional support. So we we'll really want to ho hopefully that the teachers are um, – Students are knowing that it's accessible and that they're reaching out when they do need support. So originally we were only had students that were assigned to the MARC and CERC. We have expanded that recently. So we created um, one for, for ninth grade. That's every single block, you know, that's new. Um, there's another one, for, uh, you know, for challenge, which is kind of a social emotional slash executive function now that exists to two blocks. Um, and we've expanded the um, kit, the amount of students that can access the MARC and the CERC, um, but they still are assigned. So I'm not going to, and we also have NHS uh, for some peer tutoring as well. Um, with that being said, so that's a lot of supports. Um, and I do think there's some changes that will come out of this that we'll keep, uh, but it's certainly a challenge for that reason. You know, it might... You know, the, 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 you know, with students, you, you might find out at 11 o'clock at night that you're struggling with a piece in math. Uh, and then to be, you, you know, you couldn't schedule something if that's the issue. And when you had access to the mark next day, A block, you could walk in there and get some support. And that doesn't exist. So I, I can't pretend that it's exactly the same as it was before. But we have tried to be thoughtful to make sure that we are meeting the needs um, of kids. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for everything, I mean, for really for everything. I appreciate that. And I must say the background, your background, Sarah, is exceptional. 
that I I have to, that's my my sixth grader did that during quarantine last year. Well, and, and, you know, I could work out if they're looking for a small part time job. Um, <laughs> <but> <laughs> that just <laughs> and the rest of us sit here thinking my kids didn't do anything that productive during <laughs> <laughs> um mike i don't have any questions left i just want to say it's amazing and the high school is going amazing and i said to linda and amy earlier i'm so impressed with the students i'm so impressed with the teachers um you are another hero to us you're you're keeping us going but i will keep time. so i appreciate that thank you certainly a team effort and uh, be lost without Brian Miller and Katie Stahl, so two great colleagues. Mike, I might use that as my segue, the, the team reference. Um, when, when we go to the detail on the plan, uh, on the initiatives, um, a lot of the reference to person responsible refers to admin team, uh, which of course means a team, but as a practical measure, does it mean you as the point person? How do we understand? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I would say we would have to go line by line, and it, it truly is a team effort. There's certainly a division of labor, um, and you know, sometimes I will take more of a responsibility on something, and sometimes other team members will. So it really is a team effort. It's not something anyone can do alone. And uh, you know, I have two uh, exceptional assistant principals for sure. So I would offer up. Uh, in teams, our strength. Uh, at the very same time, we wouldn't want to lose the uh, the accountability that goes with uh, one putting their their, uh, their their name next to an initiative. Well, I can tell you this, Court. Um, you know, one thing I've learned as a leader is that you accept the blame and uh, share the accomplishment. So, when there's a mistake, um, I will often own it. Uh, even when it's not mine. Mm -hmm. And that I could give, I would cite an example from today, but I'm not going to. So if something goes wrong, ultimately it's my responsibility. So yeah, uh, you're looking at the person who uh, went to figure out right here. Got it. Thank you very much. Good to hear. Appreciate it. Michael, can you uh, tell us a little bit about um, the work of the, um, the Challenge Success Committee at the high school this year? Yeah, thank you for, um, for the question. And I would kind of echo what with Justin said, a lot of these practices are embedded in what we do. And, um, you know, even everything from the systemized testing to the no homework weekends to, um, you know, just all of, of what challenge success encompasses. And, and we, stu we, we still stay in communication, um, you know, with challenge success and in last year we hosted. Um, and so I do think there are additional practices uh, that we can implement and we're very mindful of you know the past practice and make sure that we're sustaining them and always open to a, a you know additional initiative to make sure that we are we're keeping this really important work going i will say that i can to a person staff you know to all teachers administrators that it's really hard to take on anything new at the moment you're, you really are just kind of treading water every day trying to to make it all work but that can't, it can't get lost because um, it's, it is really important work that has occurred and we need to be really mindful. I mean, I, I can tell you, I have some worries right now. This is the early decision week. It was cited by um, two of our exceptional students. So, you know, there's going to be some really devastated kids this week. And, um, and it's, you know, college applications are, are higher than they've ever been. Um, we probably have a lot of kids last year that decided to that get accepted and, decided to take a gap year, so there's not even as many seats. So, you know, it, it spans 9 through 12 for sure, but I worry a lot about seniors. I feel like they had a really tough year and a half. Um, and, I have, well, I don't mean to say year and a half. I've already fast-forwarded them until June. But, you know, very much that they're going through a process that, that is going to dictate the next four years of their life. And, you know, they're, they're, they're hanging on every uh, acceptance. So. Um, I'm going to continue to remind them that in the end, it's going to be okay, but it's really hard to convince an 18 year old of that right now if they don't get the news that they want. So um, I'm glad you asked the question. We need to continue this dialogue um, because I do worry just about the amount of work that kids are, 
are, are doing and the resume they're trying to build, trying to make themselves not only doing things they enjoy, but trying to make themselves the most attractable candidate for whatever they're trying to do after high school. And, you know, it's really hard to be a teenager. It's, it's certainly different than when I was. There's different challenges, but it is really hard to be a teenager right now. Yeah, thank you. That's actually at the core uh, of, of challenge success, right? The, 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 the different paths to, uh, to, to, to success and their emotional well-being. So thank you for supporting them. Um, yeah. There. Well, thank you for the question. One last little anecdote I will say is, you know, I do wear the social media, right? We're talking to them all the time. They roll their eyes. But I had to laugh. We were, I was walking into my advisory class. I knew I reviewed the lesson before. It was a it was a lesson on social media and phone usage. And when I walked in, there was 12 kids in there, and every one of them had their face buried in their phone. And we just laughed together. I was like, this is hilarious. <laughs> no one's talking. They're all just sitting there like this. So uh, I have two children. I am also uh, fighting the same battle. So. You wonder if they were talking to each other, though. <laughs> yeah, probably. Maybe they were, right? Maybe they were. Uh, if I may, um, I, I just wanted to extend a big, big thank you as a parent of a high schooler. So I get a, a little window into what um, what efforts have been put into bringing the students um, into school and really supporting everyone, whether at home or um, or um, attending hybrid classes. Um, it's been uh, I know it's it's. Um, it's a huge load on, on the teachers, and they've really stepped up. Um, everybody has stepped up and um, has been reinventing uh, teaching and learning this year. And it's just amazing how nimble um, everyone, the students and the teachers have been. So um, lessons will not be lost on this pandemic. I'm sure there will be a lot of great things that will come out out of this unfortunate um, uh, uh, situation. Um, so really great, great thanks to, to all of you for all the work that you're doing every single day um, because it makes a huge difference for in the lives of these kids. Um, um, but um, I also wanted to, um, to the point that you were making about um, uh, challenge success and also um, the kids that will be um, getting their letters, whether uh, acceptance on, or they will be disappointed. Just wanted to to uh, ask if um, if the administration is taking any sort of uh, look around uh, what other high performing districts are doing. Whether you know how our student how how can we make sure that we are supporting our students in a way that they can be competitive um, when it comes to the application time. Right. So we don't. With our um, policies, we don't we don't put them in a strategic um, disadvantage against other districts. Um, whether it's you know the way that other districts are grading, the way that they're looking at um, uh, extracurricular activities, or um, it, it's just such a different time <laughs> uh, to navigate, like how to build that resume. I wonder what, you know, in midst of everything else, and I understand that there's just so much going on, um, but if, if you know, what, what are, what, what you guys are thinking on um, how this, how this, uh, you know, sending our students off to compete uh, is going to look, look like. I can tell you that we would never make a conscious decision uh, to put our kids at a disadvantage, ever. We recognize we can't minimize the importance that kids feel in terms of what college they're going to go to. And I have no interest in trying to convince people um, or students that, of the, that it, you know, you should not be looking at certain tiers of school. So we recognize the importance and there uh, we can all have a philosophical debate about how important it truly is. But that's different from the, our practices on a daily basis. We would never put them on a in, uh, at a competitive disadvantage. And I can tell you the amount of work that went into just looking at our ninth grade science offering um, and, and to, to make that change to planet Earth instead of biology. That was the first place we went. And we went to college admissions offices. We looked at other schools. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't putting our kids at a competitive disadvantage. And we know that we're not. Um, and so I would say that the amount of offerings at our school and what we have to offer really allows kids a tremendous opportunity to 
uh, for a competitive advantage. But I would say in the spirit of challenge success, and I use the term resume, and maybe I shouldn't have. So because um, because then you also used it. I, sh I probably shouldn't have said it. They're trying to make themselves appealing to college. That I understand. What truly is important is that kids do pursue what they really want to do. And, you know, I heard something from an admissions council that has stuck with me. Uh, that was, we're looking for a well-rounded student body, not necessarily that every student is really well-rounded. And so whatever your thing is, do it and do it to the best of your ability. Um, and that's really important. So we want kids to enjoy the experience. Um, and in order to enjoy the experience, you have to actually pursue things that you really like. And we don't want high school just to be the, you know, the stepping stone to what's next. Yes, you have to do your best work, your hardest prepare to be an appealing candidate. Um, but make sure that you're also doing what you enjoy and finding out and exploring different things. So, I, I would just add that um, we know and have known through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey for over a decade that the stress in our uh, students is um, out of the norm. It, you know, it's much higher than all the other surrounding high performing and all the other surrounding districts. And stress is a performance inhibitor. So I always say we want to do good so we can do well. We actually think that students' um, academic performance, their social emotional well-being will actually be enhanced if we can find ways to decrease the stress. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments? No. I have another question. This is sort of like just talking about what Chris was just talking about. Do colleges see that, like when they're factoring in their, how they look at students? Like, is there a productive dialogue between secondary education institutions, public, private, whatever, and that at talking about the uptick and the stress dialogue and how that plays into evaluating kids or, and, and is that even like heightened this year? Um, I think, I don't, I don't know if that dia specific dialogue exists. We do have, we, we've had, we've had admissions consults who come and they speak to parents, you know, our staff, uh, students and, um, you know, stress is certainly discussed, but it's not unique to Concord, right? The kids are, are feeling stressed, um, you know, really, especially at high-performance schools. Kristen pointed out that, you know, we are on the higher end for sure. Um, but, you know, the, the, the reality is there's going to be, you know, 50,000 applications for a small percentage of seats. And so um, part of it is looking at just expectations and um, that there are going to be 30,000 supremely qualified kids that are going to be denied by um, by Stanford, for example, and they would go there and they'd excel. Um, and there's 30,000 other kids that just like them that, that get tonight. So we do have to recognize that things have changed. Um, the landscape has changed. And so I will say that the quality of the education at schools like Concord, at Lexington, and Lincoln Sudbury, that definitely weighs heavily in an admissions process. There's no question. They know the kids that arrive there are going to be well prepared. Um, and they're going to they're going to excel, and they're going to add to the student body. There's no question. Cool. Michael, can uh, to your point, sorry, to your point, uh, Mike. Yes, the schools definitely have. Uh, they think very highly of our students when they're applying. We have a very good reputation uh, looking at uh, the application process of last year of my student student. So uh, highly regarded by. Uh, many of our schools, they like our students. Yeah, I could certainly cite statistics, but it would be the antithesis of what we're saying about, you know, challenge success. But, you know, of course, <laughs> I'm aware to some degree. If I can uh, shift the conversation to juniors. Um, so this specific year, um, what is um, what is the process uh, for uh, directing, informing this year's junior class um, in person? I know there's a lot of, of uh, virtual education to uh, parents of Zooms and webinars. Uh, what is happening in the building between guidance and uh, junior students this year? 
So I would, you know, so we, we have a few different things. Number one, we have what we call, you know, seminars that they're, they're done through advisory. It, 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 you know, the students might be in the building, but it's likely on zoom. Um, if it, you know, to be clear, but it's, you know, it's, I guess it's technically transpiring in the school. Um, so those junior seminars are very much focused on, um, where students should be in there if they are in fact applying to college in, in the process. Uh, you know, we've also, um, used a, a free resource this year called the College Guidance Network, and they've put out a, a weekly program about the college process. Um, and so we've, you know, we've shared that. And so, you know, I do think that we, um, you know, we, we, we do our best to inform uh, the student body. The guidance does a good job with that. It, it, it is an overwhelming process for sure. Um, but seminars is in, in individual meetings, are the uh, uh, the majority of the means by which we we give them information on the process? Yes, I mean, and this just came to mind as you were answering that question. I, I, I had thought about it in the past, so it, it is very overwhelming. And in terms of um, inclusion and, so, and uh, cultural competency, also for families who have their first year uh, student, their first junior and uh, um, also um, uh, immigrant families who are you know, raising second, second uh, generation who have not had that experience themselves of going to college or applying to college here. Uh, so that's, I think, an added layer of the, um, the, the unknowns and uh, newness. Yeah, I mean, and, and truthfully, one of the, so the Collins Guidance Network, I referenced it, they, again, we've been sharing out their information. They do like a weekly um, online forum about everything from college writing application to the process in general, uh, you know, but really, you know, so we've, um, we've worked closely with them. Um, there is a, um, a parent in the community who, who works for the company. That's how we originally got, um, um, you know, familiar with them, but it was, it's all about leveling the playing field to some degree, because not only do, you know, some students have, you know, access to the guidance counselor, they, you know, they might have a coach on the side. So, really trying to level the playing field and make sure that everyone has the information that they need. And I, I mean, I could talk about this for an hour because the, the, the process in and of itself, I find a little ridiculous. It should be uniform. Um, you know, all these different supplements that you have to submit. It's the equivalent of taking another class and it's an unreasonable, unnecessary expectation in my opinion, but I can bemoan that fact. All I can do is help best prepare kids for the process, but it's, it's ridiculous. Thank you. I we feel like we've done, we an amazing, you've done an amazing job of preparing them. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're keeping you too long, Mike. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for, for staying around. Um, so uh, it was worth it. Well, for, for us, it was for worth us. It. Yes. Thank you so well, much. I know you have a, a longer <laughs> meeting uh, before you, so I do appreciate um, the time and and thank you for all the support. I think you have earned that spot to go first next time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is being recorded, right? Great. I heard it. I heard it. <laughs> you have proof. You are here to the bitter end of this. Aaron will put it in the minutes. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Good night. Thanks so much. Good holiday, Mike. Yeah, you as well. Okay. In that same yeah. mode, I might request we consider uh, moving the survey results up because Kristen's here to do that, and that would let her have the rest of the evening as well. I'll move for both committees that we move item, what is it, uh, where are we, item eight, uh, parent, staff, and student survey results up to right now. A second. Uh, second. Uh, d discussion. Uh, we have two items under uh, item eight. Is that correct? Should we move them both up? What are we thinking? Well, uh, isn't Kristen going to join us for the cultural competency discussion? She probably should. So if we could put both of them next to each other and go to those next two. Yes. Yes. Cool. Right. Which was next. Unless I'm looking at an old one. I thought cultural competency was next. So that would be after. 
survey results if we do survey She's more, yeah so if you want to do that but then if we could move the survey up before the retirement incentive and jared's going to come back come on for the retirement piece okay so if we're going to go to cultural competency oh sarah and court is that oh, okay. yeah that's fine heather i stand corrected there's a uh, I'm looking at a second version, and we're on a third version of the. Agenda. Okay, got it. I was... For, forgive me. Okay. So right. I think because that was a motion, let's do it right. Let's roll call. Okay. It. Yeah. Well, if okay, are we going to the? Okay, yeah. Go ahead. So we're moving item eight up to right now. Got it. So we're going to have Kristen, Kristen will present first, and then we'll do the cultural competency. Yeah, we're going to go survey and then cultural competency. Okay. Alexa, you're on. And we got a motion. You're muted. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. That I for both. Ms. Dad, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Randy, I for both. I for region. So we're clumsy, but we get there, Kristen. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. We're happy to be here. Lori, are you going to show the slides? Yes, I can do that. Oh, great. Just take me a minute here. I've got so many things open at the moment, I'm trying to flip around. So I'll just start talking about the survey. Um, there's a tremendous amount of data. So I've tried to boil it down into one uh, presentation that has over 70 slides. So I'm not gonna talk you through 70 slides. I'm gonna boil it down even further, um, but there's uh, more detail under everything I'm gonna say. So we gave the survey uh, in November. We gave it to students um, in grades five through 12. Um, we gave it to parents and we gave it to our faculty. And um, we had over 2,000 people respond in those various groups. Uh, the surveys had um, six sections in each of them, um, the same six sections, but slightly different questions depending on um, if you are a student or a faculty member or a parent. Um, the most important thing um, that you're going to learn in this survey, and I've crunched a lot of numbers on a lot of school surveys um, in my time, and I've never seen such a remarkable result as a positive result as we've had here. Um, we had, um, and Lori, maybe if you can just advance it um, to uh, where it says uh, what's going well. It's on slide 22, it starts. Yeah, so we had over 90% of parents say that school is good, very good, or excellent. And um, if you could just go to the next one, uh, we have 85% uh, of students and 85% of faculty. So that is tremendous in the time of a pandemic. I think people are kind of amazed that we're back in school and we're back in school at the level that we are with the care and thought. Um, and it just comes out in every way. So um, if you could just go back to um, slide 22. I basically, uh, I, all the graphs are here. As I said, there's about 70 um, uh, graphs that are um, all the quantitative data that people gave us. So what I'm gonna actually talk you through is the qualitative data. So we had over 500 pages of uh, 10 point font comments that people gave. So how I crunch the numbers is if five or more people said a comment, then I put it in here. Um, but if it was overwhelming, meaning over a hundred people said it, um, then I tried to show that the, how many people that that was a very uh, powerful statement. So uh, in the parents comments, and this is all from what's going well, and then I'll talk about uh, after this, what could be improved. Um, so in the parents' comments on what's going well, um, basically people were just incredibly grateful for having in-person school. And they report that their kids' spirits are better now than in the spring because of the structure and the routine, the relationship with the teachers uh, is easier to build, um, and seeing friends. Parents are grateful for all our sports clubs, after school, extracurricular, all, all of those things that are keeping their kids engaged. 
Um, and uh, by November, um, parents reported overwhelmingly that their their kids had fully adapted to you know our weird schedule that it's different from um, in the past. And um, this fall, we have more learning and more accountability than in the spring. And I think the last uh, sort of overwhelming comment was that uh, online classes via Zoom are more engaging than anybody thought. So if you could just go to the next slide. So these are the student comments. Again, grateful for being in school, happier now that they are in the spring. If I read the word friends, being able to see my friends, and like if I had a dollar for everyone, we could fund the you know entire school district. Um, and very interestingly, kids also brought up being able to see and make new friends because it's hard to make new friends uh, when you're all virtual. Um, they kids love seeing their teachers in person. That's really important. It's easier to um, form relationships. Uh, they feel safe with all the safety precautions that are in place, the masks and so forth. Um, students are recognizing that teachers are working hard and, and that it's paying off, that they're learning. Um, and the students have adjusted to the structure and routine. Honestly, kids usually uh, adjust much more easily than adults. So uh, I wasn't surprised by this one. Um, and again, they report that they are learning more. Um, and that their classes on Zoom are more engaging than they thought they would be. Um, kids like the mix of in-person and online. Um, you know, they, <laughs> you know, there were comments like, well, on the days that I'm home, uh, I can like be in my sweats and I can like have my dog under the table and pet, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and students also like our uh, half day Wednesdays. So those are the positive comments from the students. And then the next is the faculty comments. Um, again, uh, they've said students are really happy to be back. It's just like grateful um, feeling uh, that we're back. Um, much easier to build relationships with students in person than it is via Zoom. Um, and uh, the faculty reported that they did a lot of planning and a lot of work um, for health and safety and learning and it's paying off. Um, they report that students' behavior and compliance with the safety protocols is very good. Um, and I think that's good. Yeah. Um, just all the uh, themes from the parent comments are uh, reflected in what the faculty said about that. Um, and then the last is um, the last two are very uh, clearly being used now. One is that when we um, have to go virtual at a moment's notice, the fact that our schedule is exactly the same for in person, like the periods end and begin at the same times, uh, the mask breaks when you're in person, our Zoom breaks when you're uh, at home and so forth, it works really well. You can flow really nicely between the two. Um, and um, lastly, the faculty expressed a deep gratitude to the custodial staff because the deep cleaning, the daily cleaning, the cleaning during the day, um, all are uh, noticed and appreciated. So then we're gonna go to slide 30, Lori, and talk about what could be improved, uh, starting with the uh, parents. So uh, again, everyone said, well, you know, really it's going well. Um, and so we just want more of it. So, you know, the elementary kids um, coming in the mornings, 9 to 1230, um, they would love their kids to come in the afternoon. Similarly, you know, middle school and high school parents would love kids to be able to come five days a week. Um, and they, you know, at the same time they were saying this, uh, most people were also acknowledging that uh, it couldn't happen given the safety protocols. Um, Everyone, um, you'll see through this, in-school learning is more effective than remote learning. Um, it, it came up as a theme over and over again. Um, kind of the theme that we were talking about, um, about challenge success, um, but still, even with some decreased homework um, over a regular year, students at CMS and CCHS um, have too much homework that parents are reporting. Uh, there was some question from parents about 
uh, the deficits that their kids might have had from uh, less schooling last year um, and questions about how it was being addressed. Um, and then, uh, and, and I'll remind everyone with this comment that this was before all the parent teacher conferences. So um, they needed, parents said they needed more communication about how individual children were doing and where their skills were and so forth. Um, and then uh, right now we have uh, specials in our elementary school on Wednesday afternoons and some parents uh, said that they would uh, not, not like to not have that. Uh, the next slide is from the students. Um, and, you know, these, these slides tend to sound the same. Um, they uh, really said no improvements are necessary. We kind of like it the way it is. Um, for the middle school and high school kids, they said they would like to see kids from the other cohort. So if they're in cohort A, they would like to see kids from cohort B. Again, they would like to be in school more. I mean, how often do you have kids wanting to be in school, friends? <laughs> this is so great. Um, so they, you know, they acknowledged that the traffic flow and social distancing was really, really, really uh, good in September and October. And they felt when they took this at the beginning of November that we were starting to slip and congregate more. And so now it needed to be uh, reinforced. Um, when kids are home all day or some of the kids that are fully remote uh, did report that it's really hard to be on Zoom all day. It's just tiring. I think all of us know that as well. Um, and it's harder to learn on the remote days than it is on the in-person days. Um, they would like to have more fun, um, uh, with, especially with their peers, uh, like games. Um, they, they mentioned, you know, language classes where they're playing Kahoot and um, the advisory program and so forth. Those are, those are good times. Um, and some kids mentioned that the workload is overwhelming um, and they'd like more homework free weekends, which is a, one of the challenge success pillars. Um, at CMS, the lunch is very late on Wednesdays, and so it makes the Wednesday the mornings seem very long. Um, and at CCHS, the alternating weeks, you have a maroon week and a gold week, and that really has to do with who comes to school on Wednesdays. That can be confusing because we've had to switch it up a couple of times to make sure it's equitable. And then lastly, from the faculty, um, it, everybody talked about how hard they're working, and, and that is true. Um, they really appreciate the extra planning time they got before the school year started, and then on the professional, the monthly professional days, and then the Wednesday afternoons. Um, and like the kids, uh, they noticed that while the safety precautions are good, we're getting a little looser. So they, at the time in November, we needed to tighten it back up. Um, and uh, when kids are at home in the virtual environment, they're saying sometimes kids uh, struggle to stay focused, um, particularly kids who struggle to stay focused in general. Um, and uh, given that we have a little bit decreased uh, length of school year, 170 days instead of 180, uh, you know, we need to plan for that um, curriculum in our curriculum expectations, uh, which we have done. And from time to time, um, some technology issues come up, um, a faculty member can't get something to work or a student at home is having trouble with something working, um, little tiny, but they're sort of quickly uh, solved. Um, and then sometimes overall, you know, the few times that the internet has been down or something like that, uh, you know, was mentioned. So, so that's kind of the, the gestalt of the whole thing. Um, the next two sections, I won't go into either of them, um, but uh, there's probably 45 slides. Uh, one is on well-being, and the second one is on learning. So it's a lot of information on, you know, in well-being, do kids have an adult to talk to at um, school, someone they feel like they can trust? Do they have a friend that they feel like they can trust? Um, in learning, it's, you know, how easy is it for you to um, uh, access all the learning tools that we're using? How often are you engaged in classes? And um, th those, all of those uh, details are, are really, really positive. There, it's a lot of good data, but it's also a lot of data. So uh, general questions? Kirsten, I, I had one. Um, Thank you for, so much for the survey. It was such a uh, such an in-depth uh, dive into how everyone is doing and how everyone is feeling. And I can definitely second the feelings, how grateful we are for 
uh, for teachers um, teaching kids in, in person for, um, for, for giving that opportunity and, um, and also for the amount of work that goes into teaching right now. I really appreciate all the hard work that um, teachers are doing and trying to accommodate all of the students. My question was regarding scheduling. I, um, I uh, looked at the uh, survey results and there was a mention um, uh, that if there, if there would be ever possibility to uh, uh, look at the schedule again and maybe bring students uh, five days, but first half and then have other students come in the second half. So there's that uniformity um, of going to school every, every day that that would be especially helpful for students that are like, um, uh, that ha they are having a hard time uh, on Zoom. Mm -hmm. I think I'll let my boss handle that. Yeah, I got that one. Um, <laughs> we've talked several times, Mike Mastrulo and I and the CTA leadership. Um, every time we have even considered a schedule change, we find negatives that outweigh the benefit to changing what we're doing. People know it now. It's, a, it's predictable. Um, yeah, we, we've really stopped reconsidering that because things seem to be really reliable and stable right now. And that's half the battle, I think. And teachers are able to really get in a mode and keep covering what content they're planning on covering remote, in-person, hybrid. They're doing it in all these for forums with a lot of fluidity. And I just worry a schedule shift could really upend us. I think that's what the other districts who are trying to move forward from where they started are really struggling with. Shifting a plan while you're executing another plan is really hard. So, so I don't see that happening unless um, we're really headed back towards full-time school and you know things have started to really progress enough with the virus that we can see that there's hope there that it's worth playing with it in mid-year, so. I've had to answer that question to my own children um, and because it's the amount of work that has been put into all these intricacies to make it safe and possible. And the most amazing part is that it's seamless that a child can say, hey, can they do that for me? Can they do, can I, can they change things for me? And I had to explain to them, it doesn't look like it's that hard, but it is extremely okay. hard because of all of these intricacies um, that are part of the whole and you can't make one go away because the whole thing will come down crashing. So. Um, and again, I think I, I'm thinking this whole presentation that we, we, we may need to coin a new word for thank you. <laughs> Seriously, I, I can't. I agree. Um, we are surrounded with so much talent and uh, I'm glad I didn't, I, I meant to say this to those principles, but I'm glad I actually didn't because it goes to everyone who is working to make this possible. Um, it doesn't look like you're talking about your job. It doesn't look like you're talking about work. And Mike Mastrillo said it, it's about relationship. We're talking about relationships. You're talking about ways you're impacting students. You're helping students grow. You're growing minds and bodies. And you're making connections with, with children and families and with each other. Um, and just the example of the ninth grade academy teachers uh, is <clears throat> making recommendations to bring children into the school uh, putting their lives at risk, their families' lives at risk. Uh, that, again, that's, I think, requires a new word. There's no word for that, seriously. Uh, so thank you and congratulations. Yeah, Fatima, you hit it right, the nail right on the head. Um, you know, I work on the schedules at every level, and I always say, I can schedule anything you want. I just can't schedule everything you want. So, you know, if you, if you fix a problem in one area, you've just created 10 more problems. You just don't know it uh, until you sort of live it. And uh, right now the, the lived schedule is, you know, it's working 85, 90% of the time well, which is 
better than usual, <laughs> you know, better than most people are experiencing right now. So yeah, yeah, I would um, just offer, you know, whatever that word is you're creating for thank you. Um, I would offer that to um, Kate Squire and Karen Baker and the entire uh, Concord Teachers Association and Concord Carla Teachers Association because they really partnered with us in creating those schedules. Yes, absolutely. You know, schedules are usually a two-year endeavor, and even then they may not be successfully um, moved forward, or if they are, successfully implemented. And to see where we are with such dramatic changes in months and performing at this level, I mean, that means that's just the work of every single person who's engaged, which I think you really heard tonight, hopefully. Um, every single person. <laughs> So I have a, just a question on the trusted adult numbers, which is a little concerning. Um, I, I think we all know why, uh, but uh, what are we doing specifically to address this at the high school and the middle school? Yeah, so I, I would say that's the growth of our advisory programs in both places. So breaking the kids down into much smaller units, so 10 to 12 kids, in some cases, eight to 12 kids, uh, working with one trusted adult, the biggest thing that probably comes out of that is a is a relationship that's not based on academics and how the kids are doing in their classes, but on um, getting to know each other, having fun together, doing some academic advising. Um, so I would say the most important initiative in terms of making those connections is the um, advisory programs at the middle school and the high school. Yeah. And, you know, those numbers have been concerning when we did the first challenge success survey probably seven years ago, they were um, much lower than what you're seeing here. So I think we're making improvements, but we haven't re-given that exact challenge of success um, survey recently. It'd be interesting to dipstick that one again as the year goes on, because anecdotally, what I'm hearing from teachers with only half the kids in person I consistently am hearing from teachers that they're actually feeling like they're getting to know the kids better because the in-person groups are small. And so I guess the question then is what, what's happening when the kids are remote and if that's trading off anywhere, but the teachers are feeling more connected in some ways. So it'll be interesting to maybe dipstick that one later on as we get maybe in the later part of the winter to see to see how the kids see it at that point. Yeah, definitely at the end of the year. <laughs> Just to make yeah, sure we're going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mr. What's, what's your thinking about uh, the, the lack of many indicators about sheer fatigue? We hear about the, the level of work and, and commitment and the long hours, um, but we didn't hear direct indicators of burnout. Yeah, there have been a lot of articles recently in educational leadership, in Ed Week, and you know all the big periodicals for our field about burnout because of how hard people are working, and it's definitely something that was taken into account when we were planning for the year. Um, you know, there are some things that we've let go of. There are some um, not top tier priorities that we've you know let go. Um, and so some of those are, are hard to say, yes, you're on the back burner right now. Um, but uh, I think it's for everybody's overall well-being uh, to do that. So, you know, we've definitely lowered the expectations in um, for our staff. Uh, I think one of, like Mike mentioned, uh, one initiative, or maybe it was Justin, where um, we have supervision and evaluation, uh, teachers usually uh, write two goals that are measurable. They're called SMART goals. They're you know, specific, measurable, achievable, uh, reasonable, and timely. Um, this year, we released um, uh, everyone from that expectation to measure their goals, to have data against their goals, and so forth. And we just said, your job is to maximize student learning in a changed learning environment. So that's like one example of a small way we tried to have lower expectations because we're in extraordinary times. Uh, we use external employee wellness resources. Are those being utilized more than in an average year? 
or is our internal support system proving as adequate as we'd like? Yeah, it's a really lovely. Um, you know, I lead the K to 12 mental health team and, um, a lot of our counselors have opened up uh, some office hours for faculty to just mm -hmm. talk about the stress. And um, one of one of the um, counselors uh, at Alcott, Sh Sherry Foy, recently said, "You know, it was really big in the beginning. Lots of people came. They were feeling a lot of stress, but the stress was performance anxiety. Can I do this? Can I change my practice entirely?" And now it's kind of dropped off. Oh, wait a second. We got this. Uh, you know, so I think, you know, kind of that stress of not knowing if you can do it has been kind of solved because, oh, yeah, we, we got this. And, you know, I think the survey results were really validating. Um, parents saying essentially to teachers through this that you're doing a good job. It, it just, you know, counts for a lot. Yeah, good. Good to hear. Thank you very much. It, Court, I would just add one last piece. We've been very individual in the way teachers have been set up this year. We have, you know, we have a lot of remote teachers. We have um, flexible um, options for teachers that, you know, if they're not teaching, they don't have to be in our schools. We've given them Wednesdays. We've given, we spread out these professional days. If life gets too much for them, we are swooping in and helping to figure out another plan, another option. Do you need a medical leave? What is it that's going to make this, you know, balance back out for you? Mm -hmm. I think that level of support that teachers are getting in a really intimate way from their principals, from their department chairs, from the central office, um, I think I think we're helping to find ways to balance enough and appreciating enough and celebrating enough in a community that, as Kristen said, the gratitude outpouring, it matters. It, if you're validated over and over that your your hard work is making such a difference, it's really professionally satisfying, speaking for myself. Um, you know, that's a lot of what's keeping us all going. Yeah. Yeah, the, the survey is testament to, to the hard work that went into to the opening, to the, that it was done right. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, before we shift gears totally, I guess, my, I'm sorry, Court. Do you want no, to go? I'm just expressing my gratitude. Thank oh, you. thank you. You know, there's a lot of districts tonight. The Board of Ed today passed new thresholds for FaceTime in person or synchronous learning. And there's a third of the districts in the state are scrambling, fairly panicked tonight, trying to figure out how how they're going to meet that and listen to the con I'm just sitting here listening to the, what you just all heard for the last couple hours. We're, we're so beyond that. We're talking intervention. We're talking well-being. We're talking extracurriculars. We're talking cultural and competency and inclusion. And I'm just so grateful that um, everyone came together to get us to this place because it's that hard that a, a third of the districts are going to be really panicked for the next mm -hmm. few weeks trying to figure it out. So, yeah, thank you. And we wish them well. We do, and we we've been guiding and counseling and coaching wherever we can yeah. to try to help. Absolutely. Shall we switch gears? To, yeah. To our uh, strategic plan. Oh. Yeah, and you've heard. I'll, I'll screen share this. Um, just for context. Based on some of our other discussions uh, so far this year, when either we spoke or kids were with us or teachers came, um, the feedback I heard from the committee individually and collectively was sort of an umbrella master document um, plan to work off of and understand more of what the work was, who was doing, who's going to do what, and how it all comes together. So that's what this document is, is a, a draft. And I didn't even finish it. I didn't fill in the status part because I so wanted it to be a working draft. Um, and it's good Kristen's here. And I know Andrew was on before too. He may still be. Um, so a lot of what is documented here, this is our action plan form that we typically use to support the strategic plan work. Um, you'll see last year's are still attached to the online version of the strategic plan. And so I updated this one with a first first attempt to indicate um, much of what you've heard and and seen and talked about already. So I will take no credit for the way these are laid out. Much of much of the layout is from the presentation you heard in August from Kristen and Andrew. 
um, going through these big topics of professional development, curriculum, hiring and retention of diverse staff, student engagement, and community engagement and partnerships. And then I, I felt like there was a question of how the school committee interplays with it all. And so I, I took, we took a first, first stab at that. This is very much up for discussion, um, aligned with the roles you have, um, you know, consistently assigned to you. So policy being one, um, we even started that work a little bit this week, looking at a um, curriculum and sensitive material policy and how how we as a district manage that when parents have concerns. Bargaining and contracts, I think there's definitely a role for you to play there. Um, reinstating the required course that used to be there. I think there may be other things. The, the unions are interested in this discussion. So I think there may be other things we could talk about as we get ready to bargain, um, especially with so many of them on the table. And then resources and supports, uh, whether this is, I don't know what this is, so don't take any of this as what you're going to hear in the budgets, but personnel, materials, professional development, whatever it is that we may um, be asking you to consider as we bring you FY22 to support the work um, is what I suggested here. So that doesn't mean you wouldn't be part of all these other things because I, I know you want to be aware. I know you want to hear what's going on. There may be places where you're actually engaged. I think, for example, Justin mentioned the playbook initiative and the community sessions. I, I think there's certainly a place for you to participate there. In fact, someone might have last year. I, I know I did. Um, I think there's absolute interaction between the other pieces along the way um, through the work that's happening uh, at the buildings and school levels. The one piece I was struck by, and then I'm going to stop talking and let you talk, um, we didn't really identify a solid parent component. It's it's here in community engagement, but it's it's specific ideas and not a general, how do we engage all parents? I guess that part was still missing for me a little bit as I looked at this master list. I don't think there's um, a lot of challenge to figuring that out. It could be as simple as just holding some uh, forums or webinars or something and engaging with those who want to engage. We've definitely done some sessions and things more for just open-ended conversation is the one piece I was wondering. So that's where we are. I think I'll throw it open to feedback, comments, questions. This is your draft to work with, so I'm opening it up for you to weigh in. I think it's just great having it all laid out there in a way that we can we can just process it. We can check in ourselves and say, oh, "Have I heard about this recently?" Or, or if so. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Laura. I really um, enjoyed reading the draft and seeing uh, what has been added and seeing the blank spaces. They are very inviting. So I, I, I appreciate that. So I, I did a lot of uh, filling and a lot of questions too. Um, and I was happy to hear something that, that was um, <clears throat> Uh, covered in all the, the, the presentations from the principals and from um, Kristen, um, valuing that parent feedback. We already have that tradition, right, um, in pretty much everything we do across the district. Uh, so I would like us to continue uh, following that. And and the value, I think the, the value, it is some of these conversations are going to be extremely difficult, emotionally charged, and um, I can see the reticence, uh, the reasons why um, the tendency to uh, maybe not go down that route. But if we are going to have um, uh, a long lasting uh, solution to, to, to what we are lacking in terms of social cultures, cultural competency, we, we need to uh, to go there and invite these difficult conversations. And I think the, the value of, of the, the family's feedback is that first uh, first person account, first person experience. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to have experts uh, come and teach our um, 
our staff. Uh, and, and that's going to be complementary to, to, to inform that education, uh, hearing that first, uh, first person account uh, from uh, parents and guardians, uh, I think is going to be a, a really key piece of, of the, the solution. Um, I have much more to say, but I will stop at this point. It wasn't too many years ago that uh, culture in our schools meant uh, multiculture, meant uh, celebrating differences, and it means something very different now um, because I think it is more uh, goal-focused around uh, certain changes around equity. Um, I would uh, suggest that when we look at community engagement, we ask the, uh, the question, how can we engage uh, existing parent groups and further strengthen their role? Um, do we have school-based groups of parents who can uh, uh, contribute if, uh, if in no other way as a sounding board, if not more than that, to uh, sort of test test these strategic uh, plans, um, in that I don't see uh, a reference to an audit here. Uh, I'm going to simply ask the question: uh, If we proceed with this kind of work this year, uh, could it also include setting the stage for a? Uh, equity audit that this community really understands and embraces uh, next fall. Is that uh, implied in this being this year's document? So, so um, we've had some discussion about the equity audit and I've had individual feedback from a number of you about that. And Kristen and Andrew have been dialoguing on what the options are, COVID and non-COVID. Um, my suggestion, I think the short answer is yes. I think the suggestion I'd have is we put a separate agenda item together in January or February, hear from Kristen and Andrew what they found for options, what the benefits are of doing it now or waiting, what the goals are, what what the ways we determine outcomes are, what we're trying to gain, and you know, ultimately purpose is the bottom line to why you would do an equity audit. Um, I think this is a great foundation to then have that conversation as a as an individual agenda item, if that makes sense. Yeah, it certainly does. And and I, I would also note that uh, I, I think uh, you as the leadership team do uh, something uh, that uh, equates with an equity audit with your uh, achievement analysis. Yeah, that's, yes, we yeah. absolutely do. And break it down based on all of the, um, you know, groups of people that we're serving, mm -hmm. whether it be race or other, other um, needs, yeah. special education or whatever. In fact, the state is doing more and more of that with the data we provide and giving it back to us in really usable mm -hmm. formats. We just this week, we're looking at a set of data. So excellent. Uh, correct. And Lori, I just want to be sure that we consider it in time to budget for it, because I do think yeah. this is not, um, I want to do it right, and it's going to take some time and take some money. Um, it's not a huge amount of money, but, uh, you know, I've seen like the number 50K, um, but I could be way under, way over. Um, so yep. I'm not sure exactly what our budget schedule is off the top of my head, <laughs> but um yeah. No, that's a great point. We will make sure that it syncs up with the budget schedule should we need to embed it in there. And then uh, the responsibility lies with adults in our community, um, but certainly we're going to look for continuing connections with students because they've been so compelling so far. So they don't uh, perhaps own the initiative, but they're certainly participants in, in so many of these initiatives that are going to take place or are, are underway right now. Absolutely. Um, and 
at some point, not tonight, uh, you'll tell us more about uh, outside consultant. Uh, we've met Dr. Martin, thankfully, um, and I think she might not be the only uh, outside expert that might uh, might contribute to this. I don't know, but I'm sure we'll get to that at some point. The one thing I didn't add that I forgot until you just said that and should add is that um, your school committee goals also reference professional development with with the, with Paula Martin. And that, I think, is another piece we should definitely document here and we'll get that scheduled. In and by that, you mean professional development for us. Yes, I yes, do. Yes, yes. correct. Mm -hmm. yes. Good. So I hope I you can... Agree that should go on there, just the last thing. And I also was just going to say that this is very helpful. And I think it's very important that we have this broken out in terms of what our roles are here. So this is really helpful to look and say, okay, this is how we interact in this process. Because uh, yeah. I think that without this, we all kind of felt lost in terms of what's our role here. So this is really helpful to define it. And this makes sense. These are our roles, policy and negotiations and budget. Um, that was great. And I really look forward to us working with Paula Martin. I think that'll be great. It's important too. Yes, I agree. I think too, this is a real accountability tool um, if we use it right. I know we've talked a lot about how to measure and you know make, assess progress. If, if nothing else, this is not necessarily gonna meet all the definitions of a SMART goal and all, but if we live with this document and really use it it it's that it's a benchmark check on a regular basis of what's getting done. I, I think you've hit on it. Uh, the, the key now is how do we use this um, mm -hmm. just to generate a little bit of conversation. I, I'm going to suggest not with a lot of thought yet, forgive me, that minimally the chairs should be consulting with you on a monthly basis with this as a framework and minimally the school committee itself should re-engage with this every two months at an absolute minimum. I think that would be minimum if we consider this a genuine priority. And I wonder if if we have the bandwidth to do more than that. I don't want to overpromise ourselves or anybody else. Thoughts about that? The this whole notion of how we use it? I'm curious about this the status element of it because so much of it I don't see as stuff that you check a box and you know that's done and it right so i mean maybe maybe an annual status or that you just i feel like it's such a living component of the operations of of the schools that um or just, I just an update but yeah, i just don't want this to become a okay this is what we did at the, but rather this is what this is this is now how we operate. Like this is how we. Yeah. Um, again, not uh, thinking this through thoroughly yet. Um, maybe there are parts of it, components of it that we can uh, break down into smart goals, and those we could check on um, regularly. Again, nothing specific at this point, but I'm wondering if we can tease that out of this um, plan. Um, I think a year um, would be uh, too long. Um, so again, we can work together to figure out um, a, a reasonable uh, check-in within that year. But I think too, Sarah, the viewing the status as a box to be checked, if you reframe it as a way to aggregate the accomplishments or or the ways in which we've incrementally advanced towards the goal i think could be a good tool you know every time you add staff or every time you know a specific staff member reengages in a course or any time we adopt a new piece of curriculum i think i don't know we can use that status Again, it's just a way to sort of aggregate and list, I guess. I so, agree. Um, that's that's how I imagined it when I saw this as kind of an ongoing, like Laura said, a living document where we keep yes, we're going to need a bigger of, box. All of the activity, <laughs> right? It's not a box that we're going to check. Yeah, it's, it's a big, big box that we're going <laughs> to keep adding to. Right? <laughs> You're like never I, checking I, these boxes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> not ever done. From the school committee standpoint, 
that our our check-ins with the curriculum, our check-ins with uh, with with Andrew and Kristen, the check-ins with the with the student groups and all those, it, that's sort of the, it's the status update uh, annually, right? Um, and I think it, it, it everybody who participates in doing this stuff and in doing this work, um, they really, they speak, you know, they're the most informed source for information um, on the status. So. I would say our building leaders weren't understandably so consumed with COVID that reporting on the things that they're doing on their sites, there are many of those things are on their list. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would hope we would get an end of the year, the year report. But one thing I'll say, just micro, the, the student advisors, the student engagement, there's no, there's no staff listed at all. And I'm sure uh, principals, uh, et cetera, are working with these students. So there's more to it than that, right? It's not, we're just not totally depending on the students to be doing this on their own. No, and I just wasn't thorough there. I just put a placeholder in. You, you saw, you met most of the faculty advisors for the groups that are listed there, but that's not an exhaustive list by any stretch, so. Yeah, and it does, it's just when it does need care and feeding, and we know that's, you know, staff shift around for various reasons, and we just want to be sure that these stay sound. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If I can add, um, definitely with the student engagement, um, the ad, you know, the admin team, all the principals are pretty much well engaged. Uh, for example, this morning we had a meeting uh, with Bryce McKnight, our food services director, um, to engage the intersections club in a bake sale that they would like to do. Um, and so, you know, throughout the year we involve um, pretty much everyone on the on the admin team. We involve teachers and in, in, in a lot of our initiatives, even down to our building and grounds, uh, our, our custodial staff. And especially this past weekend, if you have a chance to visit uh, Conquer Carlisle High School, you will notice that uh, on one side of the cafeteria, we have started uh, to place uh, country flags all around the cafeteria. Um, and and again, that that was an effort uh, by our students in the Intersections Club who uh, collaborated with our custodial staff, uh, Steve Wall and Claudia, uh, this past weekend on a Saturday morning. And, you know, they showed up excited to, to get to work. And we ended up with roughly 29 to 30 flags up on, on the, if you're in the back of the school looking, looking at, at the school, uh, so on the right hand side, we have 30 flags up and then we're hoping to complete the other side of the cafeteria over uh, winter break. So again, throughout the year, you know, from admin team all the way down to our uh, building and grounds team, um, we we ensure that they are all involved in this work. Excellent. Good. Any other thoughts, comments? No. All right. Um, and thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I think <laughs> we're going to probably move on now to the early retirement and send Jared is back. One, one last piece, and that is, Laurie, if you can put a date on this and then uh, we can track it as, yes. you, as you update it. Thank Definitely. you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So Jared's here now. We're, Jared was here. Getting the full compliment tonight of <laughs> anyone and everyone we need to speak with you. We're trying to fatigue everybody we can tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always last. He said the best for last, I guess. Best for last. I think I've been on 11 hours of nonstop. I, 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 I crossed 12 at 8 o'clock, so <laughs> Zoom all day today. But... Not last or least here. Well, it's what we do. Yep. Jared, you want to? Are you good sure. if he opens this up for us and talks yeah, through where we absolutely. are? Absolutely. Um, so I can either share my screen or in the agenda packet is a memo that we put together. Uh, one of the tasks I was asked 
was to figure out what the difference would be between, say, what we paid out for the early retirement incentive at 40000 over three years spread, up, spread out equally and 30000 um, So the first chart is the 40000 and as you've seen this many times. Um, it was updated with the additional uh, five teachers that took the early incentive um, on nine one. So this is the approximate savings. It's pretty close, but it's the approximate, um, and, and it has um, an assumption uh, that we are hiring at seventy five thousand. Uh, which in many times uh, it's right. That's the average, but I'd say lately it's been less. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take a look, and it's pretty much the same numbers, and you have it at thirty thousand over the course of five years. In summary, it will be an approximate savings of two hundred twenty-four thousand at CPS and sixty thousand at the high school. Um, but overall, we're talking. At the forty thousand, an estimated savings of over two point two million at CPS, um, and five hundred and three thousand at the high school. So, um, while that is large numbers, um, we're saving uh, some pretty good money um, either way. But yeah. Oh. And I would just jump in. So the way, sorry, the way you did those numbers, Jared, was if we had offered 30 from the beginning, right? So which, but you could also go back and say, if you had offered 30, you might not have had as many people take you up on it, right? Correct. Yeah. So that's okay. And there's a way to figure out with these numbers, if you offer 35, 30, 25, et cetera, but 30 was what I was asked. Right. And I think in, um, we're not going to make you go back and do it at 35. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll just wait. <laughs> and and the 30 uh, came from uh, my thinking anyway on it was uh, a figure that we see in quite a number of other districts in eastern Massachusetts. I did ask um, multiple times, even last spring and summer when you were thinking about it, and then recently on my listserv, 300 plus communities. Um, the common response I got was, we were thinking about doing this, but no one is, um, I know other comps, uh, recent comps anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the 30 number would be from past years. The 30 I was just asked to- No, I mean, run. so I guess I'm asking court, when you oh. say other districts have done it at 30, that was in the past. Yeah, you know, my recollection is when we looked at this uh, in previous years, those were the numbers we saw. I'm not sure we found other numbers similar to ours, but if we did, it was certainly in the minority. Third, of the districts that offered at 30 seemed to be the, uh, the, the number that was being offered at that time. Okay, but but we've recently given forty, right? right. Yes, that's. So we anticipate there being, I don't know, pushback on a significant change. No, because and to, uh, I'll answer it my way. Uh, uh, this is not an incentive to leave the profession or leave Concord and go elsewhere uh, and do something else. It's. Uh, uh, in an, an incentive, if you uh, are considering retiring and you're at the top, uh, were you to leave uh, uh, a little bit earlier because of the incentive, then we generate the savings. So it's not designed to change somebody's decision, just the timing of their decision. Um. So I guess tonight we need to decide what we're going to do. Let me do, correct me if I'm wrong, Lori. I assume you need a decision tonight on what we're doing, correct? That was the hope, mostly because if you approve it tonight, we can get it out to the staff and have the information back about who's going to accept the offer, and then it becomes part of the budget build, which is a important piece usually that if we can build it right in as we go you you benefit immediately from the savings rather than 
using it later to offset reductions. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. So we should send you off with a decision tonight. Um, so it's a, so I get obviously one question is whether we want to do a retirement incentive. And then the next question is if so, at what level? Um, so I guess I'm reacting to the 30 and 40 um, with a, a little bit of, I see that there's slightly more savings if we offer 30 instead of 40. Um, at the same time, we have a track record of something that's been very successful. Uh, and there's a part of me that doesn't want to mess with that because maybe we wouldn't have the same response rate. Maybe it doesn't go through as much. And this is a, I see this incentive as something that's very useful to us and to teachers who might want to retire anyway. I don't know. So I'm kind of reacting here. I think I would at this point lean towards doing what we've done in the past for consistency, but I'm curious to hear other people's reactions. I would support that Heather. Um, I, I, I do want to take into consideration the pandemic and the the, the budgetary repercussions of the pandemic um, as part of the picture. Sure. So um, I think it makes it more plausible to, to accept the difference, I think, in my opinion. So you're well, we're, we're de facto having a straw poll here, aren't we? Well, I have a debate. I, I have a last question. How, how are we selling this? Is there, a, a, do we have a, a way of um, promoting um, a, 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 this to, our, to the teachers that are thinking of retiring? Because we are in pandemic and we are in, a, in uh, the whole country is in a different financial situation. I can speak to what we've done in the past, which is what I expected we would do um, now. And by past, I mean even just this past August. Um, I always let the union presidents know what's been being talked about. And if you when, it, when you finally approve it, I always inform them and then tell them that I'm about to push out the documentation to go with it. So I think, I don't know if um, promotes the right word ever. We just try to be sure people know that it's available because we're not trying to, you know, as the part of why this has been successful is we're not trying to use it as a push to get people to go. It's been a real, just if you're, if you're debating, here's, here's where we are as a district and an option that's available to you. Um, so I would expect we'd do the same that, you know, I would send it out to the staff the way I typically do. And then the union leaders usually help to make sure people are aware of it and see it. Um, they know how to get questions answered. And certainly as the deadline comes up that uh, we collaborate on making sure that's, that's been, you know, really visible to people. And that, that leads nicely to the idea that doing it now uh, fits in with uh, likely uh, planning on the part of individual teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this feels better in so many ways. You know, in August, we essentially, it, it was August, first of all, let's say that out loud, <laughs> you know, it was August, and we gave them, I think, 10 days to decide what they were going to do. I mean, this, we can probably give them till the middle of January, and still, it will meet, meet our needs and give them a few weeks to really think it through. Um, so that feels much more comfortable than our our way of managing it in August, even though that was very successful. Uh, nonetheless, this feels a little more, more reasonable. So Lori, the deadline would be middle of January. That's what I was thinking was the middle of January. Um, and that way that's the, that's the end date. So then we know exactly what yeah. we're working with and Jared can build it into the budget processes right at that point. There's no lag time. Once we know who's going to engage, it can, be immediate savings. Would January 30th or something? It just seems like. It could be. I'm open to that. Yeah. Uh, Jared, I don't know if you have an opinion on timing. Um, I think the 26th, the week of the 21st is when the admin are going to be working to uh, finalize the budget. So if we could have it by the, by the, the 21st, the 26th, I think we'd be fine. 
Conseil. We'll go up the middle, Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> and if we decide this tonight, that gives some time. I mean, that's... We have to decide tonight then. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I agree that we have to decide tonight. Because I just think people, the break, they're going to forget, maybe. And then they come back. It's a little chaotic. This, you know, more than yeah. usual. Yeah. And so if, you know, they have the regular staff, you know, fat, you know, they're like, this is your last chance, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. I think you're right. People um, will have made up their minds, probably. So it has been. Sorry. Go ahead, Cynthia. No, I was just saying. That anybody else have any more discussion? Just wanted to add that it has been an exhaustive year for teachers, um, beyond exhaustion, because it's been such a demanding, um, uh, demanding year when it comes to you know, all this modes of uh, uh, teaching. And so uh, it, might, it might be a welcomed um, break for, for some of the teachers that um, they, they've they worked hard and it's a nice, uh, it's a nice, uh, uh, it, it's a nice way to walk away with, with uh, money in the pocket and move on to a better, uh, uh, better things. So in terms of a decision, it, it sounds like we're mostly behind doing the retirement incentive. I think the question is, is it at 40,000 like we've done before or are we decreasing it to 30? Um, so I, I think we need some more opinions on that. I, I know, am I muted? I know that you kind of asked this, but what was the main impetus for us to look at this new decreased amount? Was it just that concerns about next year's budget and some ramifications on that with respect to tax collection or is it because it's more in line with the standards across the state or something else i, I asked to consider 30 uh, one because it is a number that's been used in like districts two because we're in a period where i think we should be looking for austerity where it won't impact kids directly. Um, and third, I don't consider it a decrease because I don't consider it a given that we do this every year. I think it's a give, not a takeaway. Um, so I, I just frame it completely differently. It's not a reduction in the way I consider it. What's was 2018 the first time it was this was offered in recent uh, in recent times or yes yes it was the 17 18 year that we offered it to help with the 18 19 budget and then we had not offered it and then covid brought it back so it wasn't it wasn't offered in the 2008 9 10 ish time period I don't, I don't know that, no, certainly not in this format. Um, at least the CCTA contract used to have retirement benefit to it, early retirement benefit. Um, that was grandfathered out. Um, this is not contractual, and I don't expect the committees considering that at the moment. Um, that'll be a bargaining. <laughs> if anything, that's a bargaining discussion. Um, so it had different, it had a different format, Sarah, I guess is the way to say it. Okay. And, and the money was not the same, it was less. Uh, I just wanted to add, I just, uh, I remember we had that discussion at some point um, and, and, and the $30,000 uh, uh, number actually came up. Greenwich, Connecticut, which is extremely, um, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, affluent area, a strong school district. They offered two payments of $15,000 for teachers of 20 uh, plus years um, uh, uh, of, of uh, working to retire early. Uh, so it's not a number that, um, that is um, out of uh, uh, range. And I'll just I'll refresh where, where we got the number from. Um, it really was a math exercise those years ago when we first came up with it, when we looked at the top of the salary schedule, you know, identified our target for the, you know, replacement person to come in, which is M7, 70, you know, the, the target numbers at 
a reasonable amount of experience and um, education and just really looked at the delta there between the two salaries to see how much we could still, how much could we offer as an incentive and still s considerably save as a district. So it was, it was really running numbers like that and coming up with it that is how we got there. So I'd say it's, it, it, it landed there because of our salary numbers. In another district, this number wouldn't work, obviously. Um, you wouldn't have that much delta to work with. Jared, can you remind us what the eligibility was last year? Uh, 15 years of service in this district. 15 in this district, thank you. Well, the only other thing I would add is I don't think we have evidence that says we need 40 or don't need 40 to achieve our objective. We, I don't think we, we know. We know, that 40, we, we know that 40 got the results it got. That's the extent of our knowledge. Yeah, we can guess. <laughs> you know. Well, somebody want to make a motion? Where does everyone stand? I mean, do we want to see where? Or I, I feel like we need to get to a decision point here. Yes. <laughs> so let me do that. I'll, I'll just give a feel for where the majority is leaning, because then we could make a motion in that direction. I feel like we haven't heard from everyone. Yeah. Nobody wants to say anything about this. No, I think I think that Heather nailed it. That the the big unknown is do does it change? You know, do, does the participation change significantly? Exactly. Exactly. I know. And, and that's and we just can't we can't know that. And we won't know that, right? If we exactly. choose 30, we'll never know. Like, we, right. if we choose 40, we'll never know the other way. So, uh, right. I think the thing to keep in mind is it's always savings, right? That the participation leads to savings. Right. Right. Um, so, given the budgetary crunch, I'll just go ahead and make a motion, and we can I'll make a motion that we support the $30,000. Um, incentive. Let's see what's for both. No, for <laughs> I'll be happy to second it for discussion. Yeah. Implied in that is that the eligibility would remain the same, Cynthia. Correct. Okay. I would support that. Okay. I intend to support it. I think I would still prefer to go 40, but I don't want to vote against the, <laughs> the, the it's whole okay. thing. It's okay to have a split vote. So I, I just, I figure we need to. to <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just. Yeah. And I, I, a, a case can be made that you, you, we do third, you know, we, we, I think. Um, but what? There are too many unknowns there? going forward. Pardon? What was your case? I'm sorry. No, I, I don't know. I'm trying to. I'm okay. playing. I'm playing both uh, both sides of the coin in my head, and um, so I can't. Uh... Um, I just, the only thing about us, but I don't want this to go forward looking like some of us weren't in favor of the retirement incentive. So I, 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 yeah, and and I think Heather, to that point, um, I, I'm going to. Uh, really rest a good deal of my decision on the uh, the larger economic uncertainty that we face. And as a result of that, what I think is the most responsible decision, given the fact that I don't know uh, how the offer really impacts decision making on the part of individual teachers. But I do know that we've got unprecedented uncertainty in front of us yeah um, so to me that that is a pretty strong uh, reason for for where I come down on this I, I tend to agree here with Kurt uh, that we just there's just so much uncertainty anywhere you look at um, and the budget crunches are uh, everywhere. And for economy to bounce back and p 
people to feel whole, it's it's, it's going to take time. So um, I, I tend to stick to the thirty thousand um, dollars. You know, we can flip the whole argument on its head and say forty thousand would result in a greater final yield. We'll never know that either. So yeah. that's right. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm leaning towards, I think, like Heather, that I think that that 40 participation at 40 is more of um, uh, it's more known to us, I think, than than at 30. Um, and I think if the goal is savings, then, you know, we, we want to induce the savings. Um, and and there is a concern that that at 30, you just don't get that inducement. The $40,000, I assume, is widely known in the educator community, that that has been the standard for at least the last few years. Mm -hmm. mm, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's bring split the difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like it, Sarah. <laughs> um, I always feel like we, we should have made a motion for the 41st, and if it failed, then got to 30. <laughs> but maybe that's not. Um, I, I will probably, at the risk of us having a split vote, I am likely to vote against the $30,000 motion with the aim that we have a different motion for 40, but I don't want to look like I'm against the, <laughs> against the incentive overall. But I, I guess if we can see where this is going, Cynthia, if you're still at 30, I think it's going to pass at 30. If I'm counting votes here. I'm not, I have lost track. I'm not good at math. I'm still, I'm still, yes, I want to support the 30. The 30. Okay. To, we could have two votes. We can have a vote to do an incentive, and then we can vote on. Okay, let's do that. Level, the level at which we do the incentive. Got my motion. And, yeah. and then we get to all support the incentive. The yeah. incentive. We're, we're breaking some Robert's rules, but um, so I'll go ahead and make a motion to support a. Um, I'm sure the language is wrong. Do we have a motion? Do we have a motion? Early retirement separation incentive. Period. Period. I second that. And if I'm and correct, you withdrew your previous motion. We heard <laughs> that. Okay, fine. And okay. I for both. Booth I for both. About I for both. Ms. Dad, I for both. Rainey, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Wilson, I for region. Okay, we're all unanimous in that. That's good. There we go. Okay. I didn't get this one. I'll make a motion that the incentive uh, number should be at thirty thousand dollars. The incentive, whatever we're calling it, for move for both. Second for both. If it's a no, oh, you say <laughs> you say nay. It's like a horse. You're voting no. Um, Anderson, nay for both. Booth, I for both. About nay for both committees. Mustafi, I for region. Ms. Dad, I for both. Rainy, I for both. Wilson, nay for region. <laughs> Oh, do the math. <laughs> but it passes. <laughs> it passes. <laughs> hey, that was, I mean, I'm, uh, Heather, thank you very much for making that suggestion. That was a, thank you. I, well, I think Sarah did, but I appreciated it because it addressed my concern. <laughs> well, I, I, I think the action we took represents uh, the collective wisdom that is available to us. Yes, it's one. clear that we're all in favor. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. It's clear that we're all in favor of this incentive. It's only a matter of the, the disagreement is only on the, the number. 
And we all want it to benefit uh, retiring teachers and uh, produce some savings for the district and hopefully it will. And, and we are all well aware of all of the uncertainties and and that you just can't, right? We don't, we don't have, no one has a crystal ball. If someone on the committee had a crystal ball, then that would be fantastic. Right. But. <laughs> okay. So, so. We, we did item eight already. Uh, we have, we did item nine B because we took the vote just now. So if I'm correct, Sarah, we have one item and that is the superintendent's contract Nine addendum A. a. Yep. So, so I will move for both committees that we accept the superintendent's contract addendum A as reviewed in executive session. I second that. Anderson, I for both. Uh, discussion, I just want to note this uh, clarifies the, uh, the uh, vacation provisions in her contract. And we had a vote going. I interrupted it. I'm sorry. sorry. Alexa. Booth. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Uh, I for both. May said, I for both. Hostelfi, I for region. Marini, I for both. Wilson, I for region. Thank you. We did it. And Dr. Hunter, we would strongly urge you to look carefully and find a day or two to take off. <laughs> December 24th till January 4th. <laughs> you don't have to say it twice. Okay. And all of us need to promise not to email her during this time. You won't get a response. <laughs> yes. And yes, and you have to promise if we do email you that you don't respond to us. You will not respond. There's a promise in public. <laughs> we understand your family is going to hide the keyboard. Is that what's going on? Uh, yes, yes. That's right. okay, Perfect. Uh, well, on that note of getting back to families, I will move that both committees adjourn. <laughs> Second for both. Uh, discussion. We, we wish our students, our faculty, our staff, uh, the entire community a safe and happy holiday season. And we look forward to a safe return in January. Very much and so. If that's possible. Goodbye 2020, huh? Yes. <laughs> and goodbye 2020. <laughs> And if that happens, it'll be the good planning of our educators and the uh, discipline of our caring community. That's right. Do we get through the roll call? Okay, roll call now. That we did. Oh, we didn't yet. Not everybody. That was our discussion. Roll call. About a journey? Yeah. An eye for both. Booth eye for both. <laughs> About eye for both. Please, Dad, I for both and happy holidays. <laughs> well, Stuffy, I for region. Happy holidays, healthy. Happy and healthy. Sarah, are you in favor? Oh, I didn't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> yes, Wilson for region. See you all in 2021. Yes, Good holiday. Good night, all. <laughs>